Hi, this is Mark Arnold with the Fun Ideas Podcast, and today I have two guests. I have Camden Spees, who's a columnist for Jerry Beck, and he's been on the show many times, and he encouraged me to get our get our second guest, our main guest, uh, that I was going to get at some point, but now we are finally presenting him. It's Thunderbean Videos, Steve Stanchfield. How are you? Hi, how are you guys? Good. So... I'm- I'm sitting in a former ball bearing factory right now. Um, I, I, I rent a little office space here and in more recent days, uh, it's started to actually look like a little office. For, for years, it's just had video equipment all over and like crap all over and everything. And so now we're finally getting the toys on the walls. So I'm excited about that. So, so now when you come to the little tiny Thunderbean office, there's like all these little faces looking at you smiling. So is this always the location for Thunderbean, or is you this... You the green hair, Barney? Wait a minute. Is this... <laughs> the green hair, Barney. Yeah, man, I told you not to do that. <laughs> I'm talking about Thunderbean, not Barney. <laughs> oh, I'm dropping toys. It's Barney and Fred. Hey. They've literally been in... Bo- oh, you got Fred, too. Yeah. These guys here. have been in boxes forever. Oh, I got something. Wait. I know. Sorry, Mark. Okay. <laughs> I my my podcast has been sabotaged. Here's the original boxes those were in. Ooh, I've never seen out of the boxes, Steve. Yeah, yeah, because um, there was a shot. Look at that; they've got drawings of them on there. Did Why you have those originally boxes, as a kid? No, I'm not that old, but well, I sort know. of. Actually, yes. Well, well, what there was a store out here called the Blue Front yeah. that had um they. Sh- it, it was a drugstore, you know, like a like an alcohol, you know, liquor store. But it in the '60s, like r- right around '61 or '62, the owner decided to take all the toys out of it. it was sort of half toy store, half convenience store back in the '40s and '50s. Mm-hmm. But he took all the toys and put them in boxes in the basement. And he had they all had grease pencil. Gosh. Yeah, they had grease pencil prices all on them. And look at that one was a dollar forty nine. Hundred and forty nine dollars. <laughs> for the baby puss stuff. But, but anyway, the he he gave the store to his favorite employee. And so she pulled all the toys out and just sold them for whatever price they had, including boxes of Barbie, so all brand new. Wow. <laughs> so I mean, poor Fred isn't worth much, but heck. <laughs> Sorry. I am enthusiastic tonight though, because it's all right, very good. But... Better for you guys. Well, answer my question. Uh, no. Um, so oh, is that the original location of uh, Thunderbean, or d- is this oh. after years and years of expanding and growing and everything? It's still tiny. I mean, this uh, this office might be 400 feet. But is this the original location, or did you no, start your house? No, I mean, it, it was in my basement for a <laughs> oh, okay. That's no. what I was driving it. <laughs> I mean, it was just a little tiny, you know, a little tiny company. And um, now we've got this spot, and then down the hall, there's another. What, what's funny is there's also a music school in the same building. So if I go into the other area, there's somebody practicing drums or piano or something all the time, hmm. or, or or somebody um, you know practicing a riff from Le- some Led Zeppelin tune, <laughs> which I think is pretty it's pretty funny to hear cashmere like at you know at eight at night, like emanating from the walls out here. <laughs> but yeah, Th- Thunderbean is this little tiny entity, and it's it's mostly freelance people, you know, working, and it's mostly me actually working at home. Mm-hmm. So the, the office is kind of the uh, dubbing and packing place. And then on occasion, we have freelancers working here, um, you know, to work on various films. Or whenever I have a meeting with somebody, we, we come up here, you know, of course. Because it's way easier than, than dealing with all the barking dogs at home. Right. <laughs> so um, I was going to ask, um, what prompted you to start Thunderbean? Because, I mean, you were working in the industry, as far as I know, right? You yeah. worked on things like Space Jam and Harvey Birdman and other stuff like that that I've seen. I, and I working, Yeah, it was working in animation. I, I still do here and there. You know, I, I still emanate on some things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've always, I, I mean, I started working at a company that did CD-ROM games. Mm-hmm. So this, this sort of dates me. I, I, I started really... I started working professional in 93. So um, I was a little bit of a late bloomer in that way. And, um, and I, I, I got so lucky to meet so many other great cartoon people. You know, and it's funny, uh, Mark, I've heard your name for all of these years. And I think this is the first time we've really talked to Probably, each other. Probably, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, Jerry mentioned you frequently. And um, 
and, you know, I, I got to know Jerry and, and you know, Mark Hosler and Milt Knight and, mm-hmm. oh gosh, Mike Cazella. Mike Cazella is a fascinating person. Mike's from out here, actually. Mm-hmm. But, I've um, had them all on the show, except I haven't, know, up, I, I haven't uploaded the Mike Cazella one yet, but yeah. <laughs> see, it's like a little tiny, like if you think about this whole world, it's this little tiny group of people. And, um, but back in the, before, before I was even animating, um, I started a little company in high school called Snappy Video. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I've been collecting Super 8 films and 16 millimeter films. I really wanted, you know, as I started to get some of the stuff, I just wanted to share it more. And I, I started to work with the film co-ops and, you know, did film shows of cartoons there and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, I wanted to figure out how to transfer films and do that stuff. And it, at the time when I, when I was in college, I was working for the University of Michigan's a film and video library. So I, I became the 16 millimeter film inspector there. <laughs> so it was kind of the same world. Um, so, I, so I really have been doing this, you know, since I was 18. Um, and uh, with, with a pretty, pretty long interruption to actually work in animation. And, um, and so I, in 93, I started working at media station on CD-ROM games and then went to Los Angeles, worked, worked on Space Jam, worked on a few other things, um, a lot of freelance, and you know, an, animation is such a gypsy job. But my my primary career has been working as an animation instructor for the last twenty two years uh, at the College for Creative Studies, and so Thunderbean is the side business. Thunderbean's the little tiny thing, but um, but it's cool because I've been able to get to scan a lot of neat things. And oh gosh, I I, I have I, them all I, next to me. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Sorry. I have them all next to me right now, ready for this. Oh, cool. It, it, Camden, actually, it's your fault that we uh, updated the Popeye set. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you badgered me. You badgered me for like, <laughs> you know, what, you send me, and I, and I sent you my only copy of the of the old DVD, and I said, well, maybe this is worth updating a little bit, you know. <laughs> Yay me. Gonna... Now, he gets all of them. I mean, I should get all of them. I buy person. every one of them. Steve, I'm going to tell you this right now. This is true. Okay, I work in a library part time. And about half of my spending budget, this includes food and everything, oh, goes to Thunderbee Animation. I'm going to like feel bad now. <laughs> well, I, do, I live with my parents, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I did this with, with old cartoons, like the big reel would come, and I would literally spend whatever I earned at Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> was going was going directly to buying sixteen millimeter cartoons. Now I have now I have money saved. Now I have money also. Sa- I said money out of my spending budget. I have money saved for grad school too. A good idea. Yeah, <laughs> cartoons can't be everything. No, but I bought but I've bought every set that's come out. Oh, that's about. cool. Thank you so much. It really does help. It, yeah. it isn't. It isn't like people are like knocking down the door to buy this stuff. <laughs> you know and. I will say I should buy every set. I mean, he's holding up the Betty Boop set, and I go, I don't have that one. (laughs) Mark, I'll send it to you. Just bug me. Oh, I don't want to get them for free. I should pay you for them. Sometimes you you have to pester me a little bit. uh, I do have a few of them, so it's not like I don't. I mean, so you have no idea what we're doing. Yeah, I I tend to have more of the DVD ones. When they switched over to Blu ray, I wasn't necessarily chomping at the bit to switch to Blu ray with anything. I mean, I do, but, you know, and I do have the Blu-ray of the Popeye. That's one of the first ones I got because I just love Popeye. So I I really love Popeye too. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so the toys that are around, like I've collected some of them, but a lot of it is the stuff that was at my mom's house. My mom never threw out any of my toys. Mm -hmm. So, so I've got all my Popeye stuff from when I was a kid. (laughs) It's it's mostly Humpty Dumpty's and Popeye for some reason. Yeah. But I guess that's what I liked. I don't well, it's, know. it's funny because everybody thought thinks of me, it, like even Camden, uh, thinks of me as the Harvey guy, you know, and because I've done so much with Harvey comics and everything yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. But my first love was Popeye, and I st- still have all my toys from way back when. I lost them for a while because my brother stole them. But when my <laughs> when my brother grew up and moved out, I went back home and I. I took them back. So <laughs> that is so cool. So I have everything. Your original toys is pretty amazing. Oh, that's I don't a- have. I don't have that one though. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. I like that a lot. Give me, give me, give me. Have you have you seen the Jiminy Cricket getting stabbed with the violin? No. 
I don't know if he's here. He might be at home. Hold on. <laughs> Jiminy Cricket stabbed with a violin. It's a little walkie Jiminy. Is it a toy? It's a Jiminy Cricket walker like that. Oh, oh he's not here. Oh. He's not here. Yeah, yeah my ramp, my only ramp walker is this Popeye one. It's not in the best of shape, but it's but for he's... how I found it, I found it for like three dollars at a flea market. So yeah. oh, that's perfect. Yeah. But, the, the, the Jiminy, he's holding a violin. He's like walking with a violin in front of him. <laughs> and the violin goes through his back. You can see they've just painted it through the middle of his back. It's not like under his arm. It's a weird wow. carving. Wow. I like it a lot. He's getting stabbed. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a couple of Popeye things I have since we're talking Popeye. Um, I have like a little uh, marionette of Popeye. It made out of plastic. You know, granted, all this stuff is from like the 70s. Very that, few stuff from the 60s and earlier. Is uh, that like a Mattel one? I don't know who made it, but it's like not very big. Maybe oh, about cool. a foot high. And it has little joints that kind of wiggle around. I have oh, one of those cool. those push button things where, you know, the, the, oh, the he character is oh, 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 oh. bends over and everything when you push the button and kind of <laughs> dances. Um, I have, oh, this is the weirdest thing. You know, kids toys when you like little baby toys. Like a rattle and it has like kind of like this yeah. kind of noise i can't even imitate yeah. it but uh so it's like this round stuffed plush body like this it's like blue and it has popeye's head on the top oh i like that, that I've <laughs> and i've had that, that since i was a baby you know it's I've, like... I've got that one too and it, <laughs> mine has like a talk box in it but it doesn't work yeah i don't have that <laughs> one of these days i want to get it fixed because it, it had have, Jack Mercer doing the voice. On, on I don't have that. It, like Cameron has like every Popeye thing I don't have. <laughs> no, um, I've actually got a Popeye shirt on. Cool. From Chester, Illinois. Mm. So all yeah. my Popeye shirts are worn out, though, honestly. Because yeah. I was wearing Normally them. I'm wearing cartoon shirts, but today I, I'm dressed up. No, it wasn't because yeah. <laughs> it's just I do wear other shirts sometimes. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think other Popeye stuff. Um I have a lot of Popeye comics talking about, and a lot of Popeye records. Stuff out. What, oh, what? You keep talking. I'm just going to keep pulling stuff out. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this old stuff. Um, we, I got to meet uh, one the Carlton Comics guy. Uh, I got to meet... Uh, and, I, that, and I got um, to meet... George Hyatt. Wildman? George Wildman, yeah. Okay. He, he came down a couple of times to uh, Chester, Illinois. Mm -hmm. So have you ever been to the Popeye picnic? No. It's been too many years since I have, but Chester, Illinois, is, a, is the hometown of Elsie Sager, and uh, the yeah. uh, the, the folks family over there are really nice. I've never been over there, but I know the folks there; they're really nice. The 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 places they, they have a little shop there, which is the Opera House that uh, that Sager actually worked in as a kid, and I, and I found out the pronoun pronunciation is actually Sager rather than Seeger or cigar, even <laughs> though he has a little cigar there. But the family said that it's always been Sager. And always been pronounced that way, hmm. um, but but anyway, it was it was funny because uh, um, the 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 opera house is sort of a Popeye museum as well, with every imaginable Popeye toy there, and they also have a lot of Popeye merchandise for sale that you can buy online. And the coolest thing is that uh, Mike Brooks, who runs the Popeye fan club, has uh, he's he's a programmer, but he's got his website set up like it's the early '90s still. I have seen it. <laughs> It literally hasn't changed the whole time. Like 30 years of uh, looking like a hypertext link. So it's it's pretty fun, actually. Don't yeah. need the Wayback Machine. The only, the only other website I can think about that is, Steve, you've probably seen that the Space Jam website is still active. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was a hard project to work on. I, I was working freelance on it out here when mm -hmm. I was working at Media Station. And then I ended up working freelance for several studios at the same time. Hmm. And, then, and then when I came out, the, the oddest thing about working on that film was that, first of all, there was a lot of other people working on it. And at, at that point, everybody sort of knew that it wasn't very good. Hmm. Oh, yeah. And, um, and so it, was, it, it became really hard. But it, being, being young, it, it really sort of kicked my butt because, you know, God, everybody drew so well. I was trying so hard to just make the drawings look okay, you know. Recently, I found a drawing that an in between I'd done that that apparently the Warner store was selling at one point. It's the only time I've ever seen anything I worked on uh, on the film actually show up like <laughs> for sale. 
Mm -hmm. And um, and I, all I could see was all the drawing problems. Just what a bad, yeah. what a bad <laughs> in between it was. Jeez, they didn't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> they probably didn't care. I mean, I guess <laughs> I hate to say it. I mean, there, it, there's a lot of care in that film, but it, it almost. Yeah, it's it's Seems really a little weird. slapdash in a certain yeah. respect. Yeah, I was, remember loving it as a kid, but I'm like, now I just see it as a shoe commercial, really. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is that the, the scene folders that were out here, uh, some of the stuff was coming out of Character Builders, in, which was a small studio in uh, in Columbus, Ohio, but they also had a division in Chicago. And that's that's how we were getting the work, is that that work came through Media Station for a minute. Um, but at any rate, um, some of those scene folders said sneaker commercial on them. So I have a feeling they were trying to keep the project secret, at least at first. Mm -hmm. But we all knew what it was. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, at, at first I was doing shadow model on the film, and then I was doing um, in between on the film. And right at the end, I even animated a couple of shots. So, but so many people working on the film. When you when you watch a film like that, you go, "There's my," sh I, and I did a little thing there. Yep, and it's like that. You know, you just <laughs> see little clips. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not a major player on the film. But then again, you know, 400 people were working on that thing or something. <laughs> um, back to your films. I mean, well, I guess you worked on that. But uh, back to the ones you're putting out. How do you get the films? What's your secret? I mean, oh, do people send you things, or you like rummaging through the garbage, or where are you uh, getting your stuff that you put on I mean, Thunderbeam oh. videos? People do sometimes send me things, but it's, it's slightly more organized than that. Um, I mean, I know I know a lot of the cartoon collectors, and you know, I've been, gosh, I've been collecting animated films since I was twelve. Yeah. Gee, I was collecting in Super Eight at first, and um, you know, there's there's not really any Super Eight on any of the Thunderbean sets, but there's lots of sixteen and there's lots of thirty-five millimeter. Um, so I guess. I mean, the, the bigger secret really is it's a curation thing first, is yeah. that there's certain things that I've been trying to find forever. And um, so my list of holy grails has been the major inspiration. And then it's just been a matter of figuring out who has it. Um, usually there's another collector. Sometimes I've found things on eBay. Um, sometimes I've, you, usually it's me, honestly, bugging a few of the super collectors that I know. The like people that have lots, lots. Tommy. Tommy said. I had something to do with that. Yeah. That's why I have it next to me. Now yeah. I think I think that set came out lovely though. What, came out what, really nice. What were some of your holy grails? Oh gosh. We'll um, do that first because they're okay. out now, I would assume. So Ted Eschbau's stuff, you know, for a lot of years. That was always my first thing was to try to get the snowman in color, to hmm. try to get the Wizard of Oz cartoon in color. Okay, Camden, come on, hold it up. You can. <laughs> there, yeah. That's such a lovely cover too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. St Stephen DeSafano's a brilliant artist. It's just mm -hmm. so good, uh, so so good at kind of capturing the feeling of those films, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so so Eshbau's work has been high on my list just because, I mean, they exist and they should have been seen. If we can only find Goofy Goat now. Finding, it finding should, it wasn't it on the um, the cartoon set? Yeah, but just black and white. I mean, it's it's kind of the first American. It's the, the first released American color sound cartoon, sort of. Um, it's really from. I mean, it's really from 1930. Um, I works flip the frog cartoon. Fiddlesticks is really the first American color cartoon, but only sort of, because it was it was never released here in color. Oh, okay. it was it was released in England in color. So, but there's but there's two color cartoons in the 20s as well. So, is, anyway. is there a reason why it wasn't released in color here? I, that that reason still remains unclear. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, but MGM didn't certainly didn't want to release it in color. They had the capability of doing it. Mm. Um, I think that probably Pat Powers had trouble getting the backing of one of the color systems. This mm. is this is my guess. Powers wasn't a well liked figure in film. It's sort of amazing that he'd managed to get the deal with iWorks, but but the deal with iWorks, you know, I, iWorks was, or I'm sorry, Powers was already known a little bit as a, as a difficult character, you yeah. know, because of the various negotiations he had had with Disney, where it was well known in the industry that he kind of ripped off Disney. <laughs> so, and I always wonder, I always wonder why iWorks was okay with partnering with him, other than him having the backing to be able to do it, you know. Um, 
I, I think that Powers probably made more money off Mickey Mouse than any one thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I think that at, at one point Powers was getting nearly as much of a profit off those films as Disney was, which is crazy if you think about the fact that a sound system, you know, that Disney had signed a really poor contract. Did but, Powers um, have like the power <laughs> of seduction? Like, maybe that's why Owerks was loyal to him only from the standpoint it's like you don't need that Walt Disney guy you can draw this character so I it's like yeah. more, I wish there was more written about him I think yeah. I've probably and I'm sure that you have too you've read everything that I could about him and uh the I mean there, there's these thoughts that he's a shady business character and I, I think that at one point Colhane called him a Nazi um which is <laughs> I, I don't know if that was figur- figuratively or literally but um, but we do know that Powers had worked for you know for Cinephone or Powers Cinephone rather was really uh, DeForest Sound System. It's almost it's it's because for DeForest went bankrupt, and um, Powers basically copied that same design and maybe even used the same equipment. It's hard to say, but but Cinephone was a horrible recording system, <laughs> just the worst. Now, when they released that of uh, Works cartoon in color, what what process did they use? It's a it's a British process called Harris Color, oh. and uh, it's 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 really I mean it looks just like two color Technicolor really, yeah. you know it has, it's sort of a green and sort of a green and red process. Um, there's three surviving prints of Fiddlesticks. Um, there's the color master that's sitting at UCLA, which I was lucky enough to borrow. And and cleaned. This this is uh, what a, what a gorgeous piece of material. But what was interesting about it is that I think the only reason that that exists is because MGM wanted to release Fiddlesticks in black and white, which they did. Mm-hmm. Um, and they took um, uh, apparently Harris Color had taken several printings of that film and spliced together the best takes because this this Cinecolor or I'm sorry, this Harris color print has splices between nearly every shot. And it's a full frame print. What, what, uh, um, what MGM did was they do, made a dupe negative off that exact piece of material mm-hmm. and released that in sound. And their, their soundtrack, oddly enough, isn't as good as the, bla- the other black and white soundtrack that was at UCLA. So. Mm-hmm. The the, um, the materials on Flip the Frog were in uh, tremendously bad shape sometimes, and kind of amazingly good shape in other times. So yeah. what a what a strange mix of material. It, certainly those negatives were really abused for a long time. Steve, wasn't there another other Flip the Frog color shorts, or am I thinking of Willy Whopper? No, there there appears to have been three that were actually released in color. Yeah. So so it looks like Fiddlesticks, Fighting Fists, and Little Orphan Willie. Um, were all released in color. It's possible that Puddle Pranks was also made in color. It certainly looks like it. Um, the other material doesn't seem to exist. We thought for a little while, uh, British Film Institute had what they said were color material on on two of the others. And, um, and it turns out that they were printed on a Kodak stock that had a black and white soundtrack and a tinted uh, picture area. Which is really the weirdest thing, because usually when you see a piece of tinted stock, it's tinted all the way through the stock. But apparently Kodak made the stock this particular way so that the soundtrack would read better. Because when printing a soundtrack in green or red always didn't read as well. So anyway. Now, um, it was Technicolor the first to have three strip or just the first that everybody knows about and Disney got the rights to it for a while? No, I, I think the Technicolor, I, I think the Technicolor sort of perfected the process okay. with cartoons, honestly. So none and, of these others, Harris or Cinecolor, they were they attempting to do three color or did they just say, ah, two colors enough or Cinecolor did it not even was, occur to them? Cinecolor was trying over and over. I mean, there's, you know, they, they were definitely experimenting with it. And there's, if you, if you look in, going back and looking at popular science articles, which is an amazing thing you'll see interesting articles about color systems all the time. Mm-hmm. And there's a few others that seem to be announced that had never you know, really gone much further. Um, 
the Los Angeles County Library has Technicolor's paperwork. They have they have all of their papers through 67. So if you want to go research Technicolor, that is the place to do it. Okay. Um, and it, what was the, the most interesting thing, and you know what I was after, I was, at, I was trying to figure out what happened with Ted Ashbaugh. And, uh, and I've got really incomplete, honestly, very incomplete information. So you have to, you have to make some assumptions as to what had happened at, at that particular shop. But, but there's a bunch of things that we do know. Uh, one is that Eshbaugh actually set up a shop at Technicolor in 1931. So he was actually working in the same location in Los Angeles uh, for Technicolor on the Wizard of Oz film. Hmm. In March of 31 or 32, in March of 32, production appears to have stopped there. So hmm. um, March of 32 is when Disney got to Technicolor and signed his deal. I believe it was in late March. Hmm. Um, so I think, and this is just a supposition, but what happens after that seems to make sense too. But I think that Disney saw their experiments with Technicolor for the Wizard of Oz cartoon and basically held, stopped the presses and said, we don't want Eshbaugh to make the first color sound cartoon, right. the full color cartoon. And I think that's why they also, also hastily made flowers and trees into color. Right. It, so that they would just have it out so that, um, but, but they'd signed an exclusive deal Disney signed that exclusive deal, which prevented anybody else, you know, from making a film in full color. But of course, Wizard of Oz eventually got finished. Um, and Eshbaugh sued Technicolor. That paperwork is there. Technicolor sued Eshbaugh. That paper, that way, paperwork is there. The Frank Baum, Frank Baum's estate sued both Technicolor and Eshbaugh in two separate lawsuits. Um, <laughs> And Baum also sues the company that really is Technicolor Canada and sued uh, Rank Labs, which is also, which is Technicolor Britain. Hmm. So all three of those organizations worked together to fund the Wizard of Oz cartoon. Hmm. And, um, and it turns out that they had, and this is also in, in the lawsuits, it turns out they'd been licensing the Wizard of Oz characters from the wrong person. <laughs> they were licensing them from Sergeant Frank Baum, who was Frank Baum's cousin. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe his nephew, is that right? So he had no real rights to the story. He had some, he had some sorts of, sort of Wizard of Oz rights, but he parlayed that into having the ability to make Wizard of Oz films, and he never had those rights. So um, Eshbaugh specifically sues Technicolor later in 1932 to try to get all the film rights back. He's trying to get the film... He's trying to get everything that he made back, as well as the right to finish the film in Canada, Technicolor Canada. It's a weird, but um, <laughs> but, the, but the paperwork is so incomplete. It's but it's so it's such an important historical moment that you'd hope that there was more there, and there just isn't. At least that I, not that I found. And I've gone through I've gone through thirty one and thirty two entirely, and it's it's incredibly boring paperwork, except for those things that I was talking about. Well, is it all in one location or is yeah, yeah it's all in boxes. Okay. Okay. Uh, LA County Library will pull it, they'll pull it for you. Okay. So that and they were super nice. I just walked in there and they pulled the boxes. <laughs> they were super nice. It, it took me two trips to go through everything. That's what we librarians do. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they they love this stuff. And so I was getting excited about certain things. Technicolor's got a weird but and my request is still I have, I have one page Xeroxed out of all of that. But Technicolor doesn't allow people to Xerox it as for reference only. Mm -hmm. So you can't reproduce it without exclusive you know, permission from Technicolor. Mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of lawsuits in there, by the way. Wow. Um, in fact, I would say not quite half of the paperwork, but a lot, of the, a lot of the paperwork is lawsuits stopping another company from using a similar process. Mm -hmm. So they were they were well guarded in terms of what they were, you know, what they were trying to do. So when, when you suggested, you know, were there anybody else doing three strip color? They were, they were trying to prevent anyone from doing ambition printing. Makes sense. You know, the, the process, even though they weren't even the first to come up with that idea. Brewster right. Color had already somewhat perfected that idea. And, and <laughs> certainly Cinecolor had been around before Technicolor. Right. So they had um, in the twenties, they had already started some of those ideas. I have yeah. a, a different question, by the way. 
about when we were talking about restoring films like this. Yeah. Is it harder to restore animated films than live action stuff? You know, I, I was at a conference in um, the, uh, in Baltimore that Grover Crisp had put together, which was all archivists. And um, I attempted to give a paper on why animated films are harder to restore than live action films. And um, and it was it was it was met. It, it, everyone was cordial and nice. But Grover afterwards said, you, you know, or maybe one, one of his colleagues said, you know, no, no, I mean, all of these things are are equally hard to do. And I, th I think it's true. There's just specific <laughs> different kind of thing. And, and certainly someone as as uh, experienced as Grover would know, you know, he's got, gone through so much material the, the reason that animated films are harder in a digital process is often animation is on ones and uh, any kind of automatic process, it will erase pieces of the character, you know, thinking that it's dirt because it looks for reference from each frame. And if something stays the same for two frames, it won't mess with it. Almost every digital, uh, if you're looking at Diamond or, um, or uh, Resolve or PF Clean, any of the, any of the software packages mm -hmm. will kind of leave it alone if it's on twos, but as soon as it's on ones. So you see a lot of TV animation where mouths are on ones and they're getting erased but everything yeah. else is perfect. Right. I was talking to several people, and I think you mentioned this once in the Thunder Bean forum, Steve, that I don't understand the obsessiveness right now of people, random people, thinking they can restore film by just scanning them. It's it's a new thing, but it's it's sort of it's sort of the fault of the small little group that's been scanning things and putting things up. So I, I have to take some blame for this, honestly, <laughs> because I've, I've talked about it a lot, you know, and I, I, I like the idea that there's small entities doing these things. So I'm, I'm, I'm not against people doing that. It's, but by just scanning a film, you're not restoring it really. Right. You know, it's kind of nice that people are starting to use some restoration software to fix things up too. But now to me, the real thing to do I mean, if we're going to do this properly, it's to try to find the best material or work with a master material if it exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's a copyrighted film to get the rights if, before you're just, you know, restore. Yeah, I know, I know who you're referring to right now. I, I mean, I do a lot of public, I do a lot of public domain stuff. Yeah. You know, I do some licensed things, you know, Flip the Frog and um, Willy Whopper are licensed and the comic colors are licensed, even though they're public domain. We're, we're going back to the negatives on those which is, God, that stuff is cool, by the way. I, I just <laughs> wasn't wound on these little spindles, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so, so no, I, I, I appreciate that people are doing things and because I see it as a conduit to them doing it professionally. So, we're, but we're in this weird period right now where there's, I, I like to call it the cartoon wars right now, <laughs> where there's sort of these different factions like complaining about this group or that group. And quite honestly, have at it, you guys, fix things up. Make things beautiful. Um, I don't, I, I, I think it, it's kind of safe to say that I was one of the first people to really start trying to do cartoon sets at this kind of quality and re followed really closely by Tommy Stathis. And, um, and I had a big hand in trying to help him get his uh, organization going. And he's done, a, he's done a fantastic job of curating and getting these films seen, getting these films on Turner Classic Movies. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, keeping the faith and doing cartoon shows in New York on a continual basis. I, I dig it. Um, yeah, his sets are like totally unique though too. Because yeah. I was telling so, Steve, I consider his Bray Studio set probably one of the best Blu-rays ever produced. It's it's a good set. You know, I, I love this stuff, honestly. Um, and I'm glad that it's happening because each one of these kinds of things takes a champion. So, uh, um, my my thought is that the wars should stop entirely. Let people do what they're doing, um, and, it, and if it leads to something, it leads to something perfect. You know, I, I think the uh, none of these voices are competing with each other. And if if you also if you want to really get something done right now in this as an industry, go for it. You know, it's it's worth trying to make those connections and trying to get things going. Every, every one of us has pursued lots of things with dead ends and, and continue to try. So um, the more people that are trying, the better of a chance 
that these things actually get restored. It's, it's just amazing that we can't see, you know, all the Columbia cartoons from the negatives. They're sitting right there. You know, it's, a, it's amazing we can't see the Terry tunes, you know, all from the negs. They should, honestly, they, it should have happened by now. So, I, I mean, this is my view. This is my personal view. Um, I just think that if, if anything, there needs to be a period of understanding and a period where people are cool with each other and people are helping each other and nobody is trying to bash each other. No mm-hmm. one's trying to take somebody else's contacts or try to beat somebody to the punch on something. Because honest, honestly, we all love this stuff. So it makes sense to me to have the best people and, and experienced people doing the final work for sure. But uh, you know, I, I bring in freelancers all the time and have them learn a lot of the, uh, the software, the restoration software and stuff. But it, is there a competitiveness in this regard? Like if you're working on a flip the frog, I'll use that as an example, and there isn't any other collections and then somebody else independently of you is also working on a flip the frog. Is that going to be like butting heads saying, well, no, my set first. No, my set first. Mine's going to look better. Mine's looking better. Well, it, I got the color one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really hasn't come to that yet, but there's okay. been this, there's been a little bit of that sort of thing. And I know those folks and I actually like people on both of those factions. Right. And I just don't think that there needs to be, they're probably going to watch this by the way, yeah. but I just don't think that it needs, there needs to be. Well, any... I don't want to name names. I'm just kind of curious yeah. because it's like, it, it's, you know, like when I work on books, I'll use my own situation. You know, I always double check to make sure nobody's working on a book like about Cracked Magazine or something, because yeah. if somebody else is working on one, well, either I want to work with them or I don't want to do it at all because they're already doing the work. And it's like, Ugh, you know, um, yeah, and- especially especially if it's happening in the same period. Right. To, to me, gosh. I mean, if you've already been going down a road and working on it and then someone comes along and says, well, I'm going to try to scan all of these films now because I know you're doing it. That's <laughs> stupid. It isn't like there's that. It's yeah. a small, it's a tiny market for this yeah. stuff. I guess and, a good uh, example, and it's in the background on your thing and you put it out, uh, Gulliver's Travels. I mean, there's like a zillion different versions. Hold that one up. Uh, you know, and it's like, how did you manage to get the pristine version that's considered the top-notch Blu-ray isn't that funny that that happened? <laughs> I don't, so I, you tell me. <laughs> well, well, so a lot of years ago, uh, you, you know, Kit Parker used to rent out a 35 on Gulliver. And a lot of years ago, I'd, I'd been, I was in Plymouth, Michigan, and there was a theater, the Penn Theater in Plymouth, Michigan, was running Gulliver's Travels on a Saturday. And uh, I, was, I, I wasn't there to see Gulliver's Travels, but I, it's like ha- halfway through the film and I went in you know, and I, I bought a, a ticket, in which they were confused about because it's halfway through the darn film. And I walked in and I must have been 20. And I looked and I'm like, I'm like, holy smoke, they have a 35 IB on this film. Mm-hmm. And it's like they're renting 35 IB and you can for, for 100 bucks, you can rent 35 IB. And so in the back of my mind, I'd always thought about, you know, I'd love to get that someday. Um, Jerry. Um, had been working with TCM to try to get Gulliver onto Turner Classic Movies. And um, after, after that, af- after he said, we need to find the best print possible, I started on a hunt and just bugging collectors to see who had a 35 on it. Um, and it turned, and I found a 35 on it. I bought a 35 on it. Um, but by that point it was too late and they'd already scanned a 16 and it was already set for broadcast. So they ran a 16, sure. but but now I had this 35 and now I was scanning that 35 and then I found several other 35s to scan, to get pieces that might be a splice here or there. And, um, and I showed the raw scan, you know, there, there's a forum called the uh, golden age cartoons forum. And, um, and those folks, uh, well, it was, it's now the internet animation database. It's basically the same folks, right. um, but they played a large hand in sort of cheering me on trying to do this. And um, I'd done a, a, like a, a little special disc of, of uh, this raw scan of Gulliver. And I, and I showed it to folks at Cinevent. I'm giving you the exact, how this exact thing happened. <laughs> and so I showed it to folks at Cinevent and John McElwee, who runs a Greenbrier picture shows said, you should do this. You should figure out how to restore film. You should figure out, cause I've been doing the DVDs and we, we did a little bit of film cleanup but very primitive comparatively. And so John, who's a saint, 
said, I'll help fund this a little bit. And so he angeled some money toward the project and it was enough to buy me a license for some of the restoration software. And um, I started cleaning the darn thing up. <laughs> and so a year later, I had a cleaned up version of Gulliver. Hmm. And, um, and that's what you see. That's my first attempt at cleaning up film. And man, it looked bad at first. Because hmm. the first thing that I discovered is that the software hated me <laughs> and, hmm. and wanted to destroy the film as well. And it was destroying film grain and everything. And then I started to figure out that you could actually adjust these things pretty well. So it took me a little while to figure out what the, what the sweet spot was to do auto passes, to do despotting, to do steadying, all of those things. Steve, I find this a lot when I'm toy collecting or bookshopping or something. Do you ever find yourself haunted by Murphy's Law when doing this? By like, you know, the immediately when you find something, you find something easy, you find it again easier. And you're like, well, I just needed this. So Flip the Frog. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's 38 Flip the Frog cartoons. Um, a lot of it comes from UCLA's masters, uh, and a lot of it doesn't. And, the, and there's all but one film is in 35 millimeter. There's very few collectors that have 35s on flips. Lots of collectors, though, that have the original title sequences. Lots of bad copies of those original title sequences. So, so flip has been a continual seven years of this, man. <laughs> trying to find a better version of this or that. And then this showed up and then this showed up at, at one point in, in private hands, the, um, the uh, fine grain on funny face with the original title showed up. Mm. It's, you know, how did the fine grain end up in someone's hand? It's not at UCLA. Mm. Anyway, so fortunately I've been able to scan the best material from every film and Village Barber, or I'm sorry, Village Specialist was right at the tail end of the list. And I, and I was borrowing from a foreign archive, from, a, from an archive in, in Europe. And, um, and they kept sending me the Village Barber. So there were prints there of the Village Barber that had Village Specialist titles on them, you know, the, the foreign yeah. title. But, but then Serge Brumberg, who's, you know, I'm licensing the project from Serge now. It was David Shepard originally. Um, but then Serge said, hey, we're scanning village specialist for you and they scanned two of the best prints of that film i've ever seen in my life and you so had already and you had you already scanned and prepared to restore the other films oh we had finished yeah we oh we'd, that's 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 just a that's just a bummer yeah <laughs> right away oh yeah well we've got we've got over 40 grand into flip at this point so flip has kicked my butt and as a little tiny company that's a bunch of money for us yeah you know over over years and years and you'd yeah, I mean, because we were shipping nitrate back and forth originally, and you know, now Blackhawk actually has scanners in in Burbank, so we can scan stuff there. Um, the, the there was a time I, I went to something called Mostly Lost that Serge was at, which is a was an amazing thing that happened at Library of Congress, where they show a lot of lost films and it's all archivists and things. And when I said goodbye to um, to Serge there at one point he turned around and he said you need to make those soundtracks better and as he's walking away he's walking back into the auditorium and I, I just see the back of him saying uh, like this he's going he's going you'll have to hear the musicians breathe <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the soundtracks uh, got rescanned because his equipment was better and Serge really is a sound specialist like really god you wouldn't believe how nice those soundtracks sound Steve, so, can I ask Mark? Can I ask Steve a nerdy question right now? Sure. Dirty? Nerdy. 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 Oh, okay. ner I thought I heard dirty also. <laughs> nerdy. I said nerdy. Steve, I have to tell you right now, these, I think these commentaries on this might be the funniest commentaries I've ever watched on a single Blu ray. I think so too. I think I, so. I, I don't know why, but I can watch that commentary for the Mr. E. In Tau City, a hundred times, I would probably laugh. Is it is it like the whole group of people? It's like Mike Cazella and me and, uh, and yeah, Jared Milt and, Knight and Milt and yeah, Milt, Milt's a gem in commentaries. He's so funny. Yeah. So by by the way, the flip set has more commentaries on it than any set I've ever done. Oh wow, and that's, <laughs> that's really going some because at, at one point Eric Goldberg, you know, really took over the Snafu set and did a, a ton of commentaries, and they're all fun. Like if you watch that set, he's got something to say about every film. Mm. Yeah, I love Eric. Yeah. Eric drew me a picture I showed Mark one time of Eric. I was at a Chuck Jones event and Eric drew me this picture of Bullwinkle, Fred Flintstone, Yogi Bear, and 
and Bugs Bunny watching me on TV. <laughs> and I walked, out, I walked out of there and someone says, who's that on TV? And I said, that's me. He says, oh, you look like a terrorist. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, well, thanks, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, like, so I don't even remember what the question was at this point, but it was where, where do you find this stuff? I know it was there somewhere. Yeah, but, but yeah, getting. But then it evolved into the restoration of Gulliver's Travels, which I was curious yeah. about. Well, and uh, was so much fun to do though, just because I I love the film. And you then... know, I saw the film in black and white on on WGPR again, which was a a black owned tiny station in detroit hmm. and so they ran gulliver's travels all the time and they ran mr bug all the time yeah. a lot but it usually at two or three in the morning and so remember tv guide when you'd go in tv guide and find the films i'd see gulliver there and i'd circle it and it was on my calendar and it, right. it was 2 30 in the morning i was up you know now, i i think when you were on Stu's show you did touch upon uh mr bug comes to town or yeah. hoppity if you prefer um i like saying mr bug since it's mr deeds you know but that's me yeah um but um what's the story on gulliver versus that because gulliver seems to be everywhere is it truly public domain and the other yeah. one is not is that the real yeah. story on it Gull gulliver's copyright definitely lapsed um okay hoppity is in this odd first of all copy hoppity is copyrighted mr bug is copyrighted okay. but it's in this it's in this odd gray area because the first the first release with the Hoppity Goes to Town title was in Britain. And it's the original release in Britain with Hoppity as the title and no copyright. So um, people have made the assumption that the film is public domain, but it's not. And of course there's the underlying music rights and, and that stuff as well, which also exists on Gulliver. And I did, I did get the, I did get back when it was famous music, got the right to use the Popeye the Sailor theme. Mm -hmm. And with, with Gulliver, I licensed it's a hap hap happy day, just to make them happy, because I thought I thought okay, even though none of the other public domain sets do this, um, I thought okay, well if I make if I make the Paramount Gods at least semi happy, then <laughs> I, I've at least done done my duty. Um, That's what always it, like astounds me that Arnold Arnie Leibovitz was able to do that public domain set. Yeah. He's he's pulled some magical strings. I, I got to work on that that set a lot, the, the puppet tunes too, and those were so much fun to work with. But but man, we went through all kinds of technical mumbo jumbo on that. <laughs> I, I can't even I, I I can't even explain. But there was a lot of there were a lot of issues trying to make that stuff look good. Um, so, in the end, I think it looks like a pretty good set though. Mm -hmm. So back to Hoppity for a second. Is there a Hoppity set in our future from you, or is that just not off on the books because uh, it's um, in copyright? I don't. Well, no. I I actually <laughs> I had a deal with Paramount actually. Yeah. So this is the this is the thing that stinks about this as an industry is I'm I'm this little tiny guy, but Paramount was willing to license it to me, and we got through everything, and actually even signed a contract, mm -hmm. um, and then the business office wanted the residuals up front. And I just couldn't do it. I just didn't have enough to do it. You know, yeah. now apparently they're even more difficult to deal with. But who knows? We might get to a point, and I'm hoping sooner than later, we might get to a point where those companies are actually more amenable to uh, larger things. And, and who knows? Maybe even one of these tiny companies, you know, heck, someone like um, Kino or Classic Flix or somebody might be able to eventually license stuff from Paramount and, or... I I still would love to see Terry things. Isn't that owned by Paramount too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Viacom and all the stuff that Viacom has. It just always boggles my mind that all these companies don't even know what they own, you know, well, the, or don't care, one of the two or both. Well, I think they, they figure that people would have been bashing the doors down already if they were really valuable. And um, Jerry's made this argument over and over, even, even more passionate than I could. But Jerry will say, but you own own these things you yeah. you you own these you can do it. this is ready to go i mean yeah. I, and he's right i mean yeah. he's right but quite honestly <coughs> they don't care that much and they've never cared if yeah. if it was to make a lot of money for them they would care a lot well the odd part and you know this steve is and camden just listen <laughs> when we were kids all those cartoons are like omnipresent you always saw terry yeah. tunes all the time 
you yeah. know, they weren't pristine prints per se. They might have been faded. They might have had little cuts here and there. But I mean, at least they were on all the time. But now they, generations they, have gone by. Nobody's ever seen them, so nobody knows who Mighty Mouse is anymore. Nobody knows any of those characters. So by the, by the time we were growing up, the black and white cartoons were basically off television, yeah. except for Popeye. I mean, yeah. the Popeyes were still on, but the Boops hadn't been on in years and years. Yeah. Uh, certainly the Van Buren cartoons or any of the Columbia cartoons hadn't been on. Well, I even told Camden this in another episode, you know, where we're talking about uh, Popeyes. It's like, uh, I'm sure you've seen Leslie Kabarja's Fleischer Story book, and yeah. it says, um, yeah, it. If, 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 you, if your Popeye cartoon doesn't have these ship doors, don't, don't watch it. Watch it. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, I never saw those. Uh, now, for a brief time when I was living in L.A. as a kid, uh, KTLA had a Popeye show uh, hosted by Tom Hatton. He hosted it for like 40 years or something. They did show some of the Fleischers there, but everywhere else I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, oh. it was like, except for, say, I Love Lucy, black and white was like verboten. And so I never oh. saw black and white Popeyes forever. You know? <laughs> so, so when I was a kid, the AAP package in Detroit on, on Channel 50 specifically, mm -hmm. they would run, and, and for, for over 10 years, they would run a, a color Popeye at the beginning of the show, two black and whites in the middle, and a color one in the end. And they would generally cut the two color ones in half. Huh. So it would start with color and then cut halfway through the cartoon after the titles yeah. and run that. And I'd run home from lunch, my, you know, back in grade school, my grade school was a block away. I'd run mm -hmm. home for lunch and watch Popeye every day. And I'd see the and I'd see the black and white cartoons. Maybe it was two black and two black and whites in the middle. Yeah. And so I got to see those cartoons over and over, and wow. they were easily my favorite cartoons. I could sing along with all the songs and everything. But uh, after a while, I started to have friends run home with me, just because my house was only a block away, and a lot of people were bust into the <laughs> we neighborhood. Can watch Popeye at lunch. All right. <laughs> my, mom would, my mom would make grilled cheese a lot. So grill, <laughs> grilled cheese has a Popeye association for me for some reason. So Steve, I have a story to tell you. So I think I've told this story to you before. I don't, I don't know if I have, but you, but at one time, you know how at one time, like even like thrift stores or wherever would start making tapes of cartoons, their own tapes of cartoons and start selling them. Thrift stores would make the tapes? Or just convenience stores would make tapes or whatever? Well, there, were, there were a whole handful of little companies that made those things. Um, yeah, well. Actually, actually, oddly enough, Tommy Stathis is sort of an expert on yeah. all companies making those VHS tapes. They would reslip computer tapes, some of those yeah. companies. One, of, one time when I was little, and I swear this is true because I remember this vividly, I went to some store and I bought a Popeye tape, and the store had made this tape. I swear to <laughs> Wow. And the store that made the tape. And so it was just a Popeye, the movie, part one. I had not seen the Robin Williams one, and I was just a little kid. So I'm like, oh, well, this must be this. And no, it was Sinbad. The first oh. seven minutes of Sinbad. Just the first oh, seven funny. minutes. Just the oh, first seven minutes. That's I it. Was, I think this was a parents approved tape. Yes. Yeah. One of, that one of the be that. that. That, that company, I think, is, gosh, I don't know if that one's in New Jersey or not. It seemed like a lot of them were in New Jersey. Hmm. But it was just the first seven minutes, and at the very end, it just said, buy tape two to see the part two. And I'm like, wow, that's great. And I'm like, thank God I have the internet. Let's just search <laughs> this up right now. I never saw ones that bad. I mean, most of the cartoon tapes I remember had like three or four cartoons. And uh, the, the label I remember is Cartoons Are Us or Cartoons Are Fun. With Cartoons Are Fun, you know? yeah. yeah. I love that. And I then, love the 50 greatest cartoons with, yeah. with all well, I used to buy domains. those things because it was like, it was the only way you could get a, like a big bunch of cartoons. They were usually in horrible shape, but at least you, you got a whole bunch of yeah. cartoons. And Kids yeah. Classics was one of the first to start doing that. Kids Classics had public domain cartoons. And then they also were making wrestling tapes at the same time. Good Times Home Video was that company. Yeah. So they were one of the first that I saw doing them. There are a few other companies, and they'd, they'd always be the worst packages, you know? And like, I remember working at Kmart when I was in high school, and they'd started to get these things in. And the first <laughs> versions of those tapes were like $10 each. Yeah. And so I was earning three thirty-five dollars an hour. <laughs> so I'd buy that. I worked at Chuck E. Cheese, and then I worked at Kmart, and then I worked for another place called Cottage Inn Pizza. That's my <laughs> high school experience. <laughs> 
So you're just like Camden buying all the tapes with your buying all the yeah, just whatever, whatever <laughs> job I had. The difference but is I'm I... saving up for college for grad school too. I'm glad that you're saving up. This is an excellent yeah. idea. <laughs> Save up? What's that? <laughs> I did go to college though, but I didn't go to grad school. So. Oh, I went to college a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Emanation was calling me the whole time. <laughs> oh. I, I'm, well, glad, I'm glad I didn't decide to go just the route of making videos. I, I would have been really yeah. broke then. Well, at least you made a career out of it. That's the good thing. I mean, if you yeah. you know just spend all the time and nothing to show for it, well. <laughs> the, the coolest things is that I've got a whole bunch of former students that are working in animation, and I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, that are populating all the studios now. So mm -hmm. the uh, the reward of it, not not only in Los Angeles, but in New York and Georgia, and even out here in Michigan, oddly enough, and the the ad market for animation has changed because of the folks coming out of the College for Creative Studies. So I'm mm -hmm. super happy about that. Um, it's really fun to influence character animators and to show them the stuff that you felt like they should have seen. Like there's a lot of really necessary viewing to me. And even then, you know, gosh, I still haven't seen every Columbia cartoon. Maybe one of these days I will. You know, I've seen every Van Buren cartoon at this point. I've seen all the Disney cartoons at this point. But I still haven't seen all the Warner Brothers cartoons either. So I, I have to ask you a quick question, Steve. I read Hal Eric's, I never read it. Uh, I have so many books on my shelf I've read because I'm just a slow reader. But I've looked at, I've seen, skimmed and read parts of Hal Erickson's Van Buren book. Mm -hmm. I never knew there was a live action part of that studio until I, I, I saw that book. They're, they're, they're a tiny little entity, but they sure did a lot of stuff, you know? They had 875 <laughs> live action stuff. So like, I'm like, and I'm like, holy shit. See, the cartoons were just part of the factory, you know? Yeah. So Cause I didn't know any of that. And I'm wondering if like, if it, does any of, does all, does, does, does a lot of that stuff still exist? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I'm sure that there's lost films. I, I don't, I'm not any kind of expert on the Van Buren, you know, live action films, but certainly most of it exists. So. It seems like every studio dabbled in some live action, if not a little bit, a lot, yeah. of course, <laughs> because well, even the Warner Brothers, isn't there the Spoony Melodies or something that, that they were actually live there's action? That, there's, the, there's the Monkeys one, which is my favorite. Yeah. And then uh, uh, Fleischer, of course, did bouncing ball cartoons with the musicians of the day and yeah. stuff like that. So, I mean, Didn't so Fleischer, all... wasn't Fleischer the one who did that Betty Boop um, singing? There's a, there's a Rudy Alley short that Paramount made. Yeah. With the, that has May Questel in it. Didn't there's Fleischer a, do that though? I don't think the Fleischers did, but I think Max Fleischer shows up in one of them, doesn't he? Hmm. I think. I'm not sure though. All done in New York though, for sure. Yeah. Of course, you know, there's that uh, oft repeated, and I think you've released it, uh, uh, just a little documentary that's like five, ten minutes long, just about Fleischer in, in Miami and stuff yeah. like that. You yeah, know? the popular science one? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if Fleischer made that themselves. Uh, or no, if no, they... no. That's Paramount made it. Okay. Well, well, it's, it's, Jerry, it's Jerry Fairbanks Productions, really. Okay, got it. But, um, that, that's interesting. I, I, that's a public domain short, but I've licensed it from Shields Pictures. Mm -hmm. so that, that, that's the thing that made that set sort of semi-expensive to me. Yeah. Hmm. Otherwise, that was a cheap set. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> but we had done a ton of bonus features for the DVD, and I'm so thankful that we did because I, I managed to get involved with the uh, with the Warner Brothers project that way. Mm -hmm. and so I was lucky enough to work on that and work on the bonus features for that. And suddenly they put me in front of a camera, and I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> so that was fun. No. Camden, hold up the Betty Boop one. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, you have the Betty Boop one. You're trying to follow the all of film releases yeah. and everything. Um, this wasn't I, supposed to be an official set. It was only okay. going to be one of the little special sets that we do. So okay. like the films aren't all cleaned up. Some of them are cleaned up, but most aren't. But well, okay. what had started to happen is we'd, we'd manage. This is, this is David Gerstein's uh, doing. But Gerstein managed to find Honest, Love, and True at, at a European archive. and and uh, Serge uh, Brumberg, you know, scanned it for us. But somehow somebody swiped it. Somebody working for Serge swiped it. And they sold it to television. Mm. And so a bootleg of it started showing up. So we, we finally, as the bootleg, every week a new bootleg was showing up that we tried to take down from YouTube. And so finally we got it cleaned up enough. We, we did clean up that one. And we, so we got it fixed up. And 
And they said, well, we just got to release the darn thing before there's a million more bootlegs out there of it. Right. So, because we wanted to get honest, love, and true scene, you know. So, are there more Betty Boop sets coming then? Uh, yeah. Well, well, part of the reason that it's only a BDR, it's a you know, it's a burned Blu-ray. I didn't want to do a replicated set that didn't have everything all cleaned up, and oh, okay. plus, plus a lot of it's 16 millimeter. I'm hoping that someday we could license those films, I or maybe somebody will, and put them out in pristine copies. Mm -hmm. So, I why do they not part. want to go for the public domain stuff? God, that, that's a question for the ages. Um, I, I've, I've heard two stories on this. I've heard that Olive didn't want to do it, but it, but it also there seems, just from talking to folks at, at Paramount Archives years back now, um, there seems to be some reluctance to put out something that's public domain because then everybody will bootleg it and they've spent the money to do it. Okay. So That's a I mean, fair reason. I understand that sort of, but yeah. why not just put out the best version if people bootleg it, whatever. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's my yeah. view. Warner's just put I, out their people, public. Domain. People boot like your stuff all the time. Which I saw one thing the other day, which was like online. It was just randomly popped up, you know, in the YouTube feed. It was some guy decided to place your logo. And apparently you actually commented on this guy. He didn't, yeah, do, anything about did. it. He didn't do anything about it, though. But um, he posted <laughs> his own face on his logo and saying it was his production. And it even had the Thunder Bean menus in the, in the video. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know what that is? I think that might have been Eighth Man DVD. It might have, or no, it was Goon Cartoons, maybe? Yes. It was Goon Cartoons. Yeah, I don't know. Why Why would you do that? Like, why would you leave the, the Thunder Bean menus as part of your, I don't know, it's funny. <laughs> but, you know, on, honestly, on occasion, there's things that are bootlegged like that. I, I, I love the fact that lots of people get to see this stuff. Yeah. And quite honestly, I, I don't, I don't think that's hurting the Blu-ray sales, honestly. But it's also I mean, some of the best quality stuff on YouTube of old cartoons. So cool. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not going to hunt down and try to take them all down because you, you just can't. If somebody, if somebody, it's like somebody put the whole Rainbow Parade set up several days after it was released, that sort of cheesed me off. And I asked them to take them down because it's like, God, at least give me a couple of months, please. Yeah. <laughs> No, Steve, I'm going to ask you this. Time. This is a set that Mark has too. Um, will there ever be a volume two of this? Is there enough yeah. public domain rainbow parades? Or uh, novel no, public yeah. domain novel tunes? Yeah, there is. There is. Um, yes, I'd love to as soon as I can. We, we put all the 35 that I could find. Mm -hmm. uh, but without, without saying too much, I found more 35 now. Mm. So, yes. Yeah, there'll be another one. So I know we kind of went over this a little bit earlier, but it's like, it still is kind of unclear to me. And I know Jerry Beck talks about this all the time. So since all of us here know that a lot of these cartoons are just sitting in archives, what is to keep somebody like yourself to go to them and just say, hey, I'd like to just put out your stuff. You obviously have no interest in putting it out. Uh, let me just do it, you know, and just be that simple and blunt about it, but polite. <laughs> It's, it's safe to say without mentioning names that this has happened over and over. And maybe I've done that. Maybe I've tried to talk to every company. Mm. That might have happened. I won't, I won't deny that. But you don't have to say names, but I mean, it's like, but, do they but, just brush it off seriously? I mean, it's like, well, that's, what that's, would it cost them? It doesn't cost them anything. You know, it that's what it does cost Paramount to put out Heckle and Jekyll. There's no residuals for them. It, but this is the thing, and this is just something to consider. It costs them a lot because they have to have the bandwidth to do the paperwork, to do the contracts. They have to make sure that the films got released. They have to make sure that somebody's responsible for the underlying music rights. So they have to put their lawyers on it. I mean, you'd you'd, okay. you'd like to think okay. that it costs. You'd like to think that it costs nothing, and it it costs something. Um, I I here I, I will talk publicly about something I haven't talked publicly about. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about what happened with Universal and Felix the Cat. All right. <laughs> um, I made a deal with. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do it. Um, okay. I, I made a deal with uh, Felix the Cat Productions, which was Don Oriolo and Walter Clement, who's the, his lawyer type person. Um, and the deal the deal started out actually with David Shepard years back. Mm -hmm. And David Shepard finally gave up on the deal because honestly, they were way, way too difficult to deal with. 
And I, I like I like Don an awful lot, um, but Walter really handled the business end of things. And Walter is an incredibly difficult person. But anyway, we had made a deal and David Gerstein helped set the deal up um, because David, a huge Felix fan as well. And honestly, one of the most prominent historians of our time. He's a- David's, David he, helped me a bit with a post that I'm having updated with cartoon research yeah. too. Dave's an amazing guy because he really, he really goes further and tries to research things. There's a, there's a, I don't consider myself essential in all of this. I consider Mark Causler and David Gerstein and Jerry Beck essential people in all this. And if, if I can at least follow in their footsteps, I'm happy but at any rate. Um, but Gerstein managed to have this kind of incredible list of where all the bodies are buried on the Felix cartoons and what it would take to try to get them scanned. Um, not only in archives, but in private collections worldwide. So the Felix the Cat people had 54 Felix shorts. Um, we made a deal with Felix the Cat Productions to get at least 54 more Felix shorts. When we had those 54, which was the magic number, then that would unlock the ones that they got. And then we would put those all together and make Blu-ray sets. Mm -hmm. um, we signed this deal a lot of years ago now, 2011, we signed this deal. Um, and uh, um, by 2013, it was pretty clear that we were gonna get there, but I'd spent a ton of money, over $50,000. Yeah. And I'd scanned a ton of Prince of Felix cartoons. And we, by that point, we had 97. Um, mm -hmm. Of those 97, we, we had a lot of the ones that they had, but had improved on them in lots of different ways. And again, Dave Gerstein was invaluable because he knew what was missing or he knew what, who had what, he knew what the better copy was. So we scanned copies from all the different collectors that we knew. We scanned copies from British Film Institute. We scanned copies from all sorts of European archives, all different places. Um, and so now I have 122 Felix cartoon scanned in high definition or 2K or 4K. I have more 35 on the cartoons than any, any archive does. And we went to talk with them in early 2014. Said, hey, we have everything. Radio silence. Hey. Um, call, and, and, and Don's friends, you know, with Dave Gerstein. So we were calling him over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they had vanished. Nothing. We couldn't get a hold of them. No email return, no call return, nothing. Uh, and it turned out that they had made a deal with DreamWorks mm -hmm. and they were selling the character to DreamWorks lock, stock and barrel. DreamWorks already did have some rights to Felix, but with Translux, they had the Translux films. Right. But nobody had the silent ones. To this, to this day, Universal doesn't have the silent ones. Wouldn't all... those be in public domain due to the fact that they're over? Well, a, majority, a majority of them have always been public domain. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, we had hoped for years that we could still make this deal. After a, after a really crazy meeting in um, Mary Callender's with Walter Kelmet, <laughs> um, it was pretty clear that they weren't going to be uh, anything but hostile toward our deal, even though we had a deal. Oh. Um, so, um, so I'd given up until DreamWorks got a hold of me. And then DreamWorks said, hey, we just found this contract you know, do you, do you still have an ongoing contract with this? And I said, I think I do, sort of. <laughs> uh, and, um, and they said, well, let's try to work out a deal. So for years, back and forth, nothing happened. We kept sort of trying to work it out and it looked like something was happening and then it didn't. And then DreamWorks was bought by Universal. And so um, the division of DreamWorks that owned the characters was classic media. They had bought Classic Media, and of course, Classic Media gobbled up a lot of the little mom and pop companies that owned a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now we were dealing with Universal, and we tried in earnest to make a contract with Universal. And um, the deal involved us giving them residuals and a promised amount of residuals and all of those cartoons back because they didn't have any of them. <laughs> I, I, mean, I still have all this stuff. I still have backup after backup of hard drives because I don't want to lose all of that hard work. And we cleaned up a lot of this stuff. So anyway, we finally got near the end of the contract and Universal wouldn't budge mm. from a $50,000 residual up front. And I just couldn't do it. Mm. You know, 
I would have loved to have been able to just come up with 50 grand. And, and Th Thunderbean, it, it isn't like Thunderbean is a big money-making entity. You know, it's this little tiny company. We're scraping by just to be able to cover costs of transfers and clean up. And yeah. I'm, not, I'm not crying poor. I promise you, I'm not crying poor. We make money and it's all going back into, you know, making this stuff work. Well, you don't make stupid deals either. I get yeah. it. You know, it's like... What, what? If honestly, I, I hate to say this, if Thunderbean was making oodles of cash, I would have made a stupid deal and gotten that, but we also would have paid the 17 grand to get hopping. I know yeah. that you also um, make some of your cash over these special sets. Yep, they, they pay for film transfers basically. When we do one of those special sets, it pays to scan the films for that set and there's always a little bit extra left over that we do other things with. But yeah, it's, it's this little tiny entity that, I, I love that aspect of it, though. I like being the underdog. I'd, I'd love it if we could get just a little bigger to a point like where everything's always covered and I'm not pulling it out of my paycheck or anything. <laughs> you know? Speaking of underdog, <laughs> no, um, you tend to cover theatrical films. Mm -hmm. now, you know me. <laughs> Camden knows me. <laughs> that, you know, a lot of my focus, uh, just because of when I grew up, is a lot of tv based stuff and yeah. there is missing tv stuff and i think i even emailed you once I'll, I'll repeat it here you can give me the same answer i don't care you know so i wrote the total television book and mm -hmm. they did a series called the beagles and yep. there's about two and a half episodes that exist everywhere else in the world and they're all the two of them are in black and white and the other one's in color and they all should be in color and there's not that many episodes but joe harris the animator he um uh, revealed before he died that he had the inner positives and they're just like sitting there with his uh, daughter and son-in-law oh, you know to do, this do day know, do you know and, who has the rights to it well, well they do because it was the one total television show that they didn't sell that general mills didn't own uh, huh. it was owned outright by total television it was wow. the only, now the problem is nobody remembers these characters um Oh, There's I, only I, like uh, nine shows or something like that, so it's not very much material. Oh, but, heck, why don't we put them out? Well, see, I you know I, I think I asked you about it early, year, a few years ago, and maybe it's because we didn't know each other or anything like that. Oh, and heck, you just I'm gave sorry. me some simple answer like, "Oh no, we were not working on stuff like that," and I just kind of dropped it. And everything Did I really like say that. that? That doesn't sound like me. Yeah, I well, I can look. I probably have the email. <laughs> I keep emails. From 20 years ago, yeah. but I was maybe under I, the impression I was too busy. You know, I, I was under that. the impression, and I'm not saying that you're being rude or anything. No, I was under the impression that kind of like, oh, if it's something from TV, we we don't bother with it. You know, it's no, like no, it's, not, you know, not at all. And, I just and, haven't gotten there yet. And uh, <laughs> I have too many projects. Camden and I were on an episode recently, which hasn't aired yet either, or uploaded yet, with Strum. And we were talking about this very type of same thing. It's like, you know, there's all this archives and everybody is always looking for silent films and, you know, things from 100 years ago and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there will become a time, but it'll be probably after we're long and dead and buried, that they'll say, hmm, you know, those missing TV cartoons from the 1960s and 70s? Let's start researching and putting those out. Oh, they don't exist because nobody ever bothered to archive them way back when. <laughs> you know? the, the hardest thing about it, if you, I mean, in, 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 with, with, with uh, how can I say this in other than a serious tone? The, yeah. the problem is we're losing stuff right now. Yeah. You know, the, um, there's there's a lot of films that are still in the hands of private families, and who knows if they have those in proper conditions? Who knows what stage of vinegar syndrome? There's a large collection of films uh, produced by actually some uh, pretty famous animator that still belong to the family, and um, and there's a related puppet show even, um, and who knows what that stuff looks like now? But for years and years, lots of us have been trying to make a deal to get these things released. Um, the, the Beagles would be great. It sounds like an easy one because the IPs are probably in good shape. Yeah. We could get them scanned. You know, um, I, it's hard to say if it ever really make any money. Probably but, uh, not, but I mean, I, you could say from the, make, the creators of Underdog and Tennessee Tuxedo and play that angle. I just, I love the, I love the idea that there's good stuff out there on it. Yeah. Whether, whether I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not so, interested in 
trying to be the the, the single person who does all of these things. Um, yeah. You know, I, I just anybody getting it out would be wonderful. Yeah. But it, but if but if it ain't happening, then maybe it would be fun to do if the family yeah. was happy with it. I, it's hard to say if it would make anything. You know, yeah. but oh, the, I have a quick question for you also. The other the other thing is like the Bagdasterians stuff, <laughs> the Alvin show. Wouldn't doesn't the don't the, the bag? I heard the some bags own it or what? Do the bags own it or the bag? The Bagdasterians own the characters of the Alvin show of the out the, the chipmunks. But but who owns the rights to the actual TV show? I don't know. That's what I was going to well, ask. I think the issue is this because I did a, a, a Alvin and Chipmunk ship book. Um, the issue oh. is they don't own the rights to the Ross Bag and Sarian Senior music. And that's the key thing because oh. uh, Capitol Records owns it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they, you know, they kind of lock horns because the Bag of want to own everything, lock, stock, and barrel. And, but uh, it wasn't originally Capitol, it was originally Liberty Records. That was, but eventually, like all these other buyouts, Capitol Records, or it's probably UME now, you know, Universal again, you know. So it's like because Capitol Records doesn't exist. I mean, this, sense, this yeah. is something that Cazella would know more about. You know, he worked for the bags years ago. Yeah. And um, I, I think Steve Worth did too. Steve and, Worth. and so like everybody in the universe wants that single season of the Alvin show, except for the <laughs> Ross Bagdasarian, Ross Bagdasarian Jr. and Janice Carmen, because they like their versions because they make all the money on them. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, so Gosh, it sure would be nice to have those out from 35. I and mean, they did put a couple of episodes of them out on one yeah. of them. Yeah, on one. And they look amazing. Yeah. They look yeah. perfect. Yeah. So I've, I've scanned a couple of the prints I have, but they they don't compare to those beautiful 35s. Right. And um, I have a um, did, see. Weren't you at one time? Because as an avid research right now, I guess I've written a few articles now. But as cartoon research, I read the article. I'm 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 a bit of a weirdo. As one as as one of the only girls to ever walk into Catholic high school, that the Catholic high school after the help does called me a freak, because I'm all into this stuff and I'm horrible at science class. Um, so, I, I, um, I, you've just you've just talked about every cartoon person ever, though. I mean, yeah, but <laughs> now now, so you have, so at one time, as a person who reads cartoon research, I read cartoon research not once but twice. And if it's something, if it's something really special, like Bob Torres' post that he's been doing, I'll read it three or four times. You know, I'm I'm really jealous of those well-researched articles because I'm so busy doing stuff that yeah. I end up writing, I end up writing mine on the night that they're due. I write I write mine. Jerry lets me post mine whenever because I just I'm one of those rotating Monday people like Bob and all yeah. those stuff. I just did one with the Cossons with Chuck Jones's grandkids about the Pogo special. Oh the yeah. Pogo special is not a great special and they'll admit that they both said that, you know, it didn't wow us, but it's got a great story to it. And I said, would you be willing to tell the story? And they provided me with all these great little newspaper clippings. And I'm like, cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I, I love yeah. this kind of stuff. It's, yeah. I, you know, I think the cartoon research has turned into what Appetunes was and what, uh, um, and what mind rot. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah was after that and and i loved those things i couldn't wait for the next issue to come yeah you know? it's just like and i like it and i just thought like you know one of the coolest things though when i was look up and i look turn on cartoon research i'm like wait i'm in the header right now and i'm between stanchfield and baxter which devin was always my favorite cartoon research writer just because <laughs> i don't know why but devin just the research he puts into his post it's, it's was just beautiful. like overnight you know that he works he did like the way i do where i take like three or four hours to write one post so yeah. maybe five, and you know he did that every single week oh yeah oh and he's he is that meticulous with fixing up films yeah that, that tuba tutor looked amazing if, if so, you if you think about i mean if you, if you think about this little period we're in a little magic period right now because we have a we have the ability to get so many of these things done, you know, and there's and there's started to be a renewed interest, which for a lot of years there wasn't as much. But you guys, the new fan base is right. amazing. You guys are around and, and you care about this stuff. You know, no. I, I love that I love what's happening right now. So that's that's also the other reason that I, I'm I'm not bashing anyone trying to restore any kind of cartoon because who knows what they're gonna be capable of in yeah. their lifetime. They may do something amazing. I, no. I just 
I just hope that someday what I've done will be looked at as being at least okay. I don't you, know if this is unproductive, I and I don't even know if I can talk about this with you, but I remember one time, at least four or five times, reading about a Linus the Lionhearted set. <laughs> no comment. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> well, let, let me, I can comment on this a little bit. Yeah, there's going to be something. Okay. So, not from Thunderbean. Oh. <laughs> but, but, but there's going to be something. And, There'll be and, a lot of cartoons, but not from such a <laughs> but, but but I'm lending my stuff, so whatever okay. I have is going to be there. And no, it'll 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 be good. I, I did some research on this. <laughs> Darn it! That's all I can because say. You, because for a while you had posted all these great prints of Linus the Lionhearted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I didn't I didn't stop with uh, I didn't stop with theatricals. Actually, yeah. I love that show so much. Yeah. yeah. Because so. because I was always because there's a lot of people like Mark and I, Mark, you you both and especially when you guys started getting to this all the a lot of the best historians like Mike Barrier and Leonard Moulton they're great historians, but especially Mike Barrier or someone like that they hate the TV stuff and they yep. just disregard it all, it, and that's fine you know everybody likes something you know I yeah. I, I don't see that as an impediment I, right. honestly the the most you know in preparation for Barrier's book. What Barrier did is a masterpiece of animation history. He's, right. There is so much there, and uh, very little of it actually gets used in the book. But the value of Barrier is that he did all of this. Right. Uh, exactly. He's got material that will exist for generations now, and and for research, he's he's probably done. You know, it, it, the guy should have an Annie Award for what he's done. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, but yeah, just. Uh, yeah, I don't knock them for not liking TV cartoons. I mean, you know, but uh, it is frustrating, admittedly. I'll say this, like, about Malton, for example, you know, when they did all those Walt Disney treasures. And I thought a natural for the Walt Disney treasure would be the, the Mouse Factory. But it was a show that at, happened after Walt died and, and Malton didn't grow up with it. So we got a glut of Mickey Mouse Club stuff, which I don't care that much about. You know, it's like... Yeah. You know, so it's I like love the most factory. I have I have a few in sixteen. Yeah, I, like I got a few copies is... from uh, Stu, and uh, I probably have about five episodes. But I know there's oh, like cool. forty eight of them or something. So I was. Oh, it'd be great to have all of those. Yeah, I did my final project for um for my by my um for my um intro broadcast media class. We had to interview somebody and talk about a broadcast professional. So I did J B Kaufman, and he agreed to do oh, it. Oh. So I profiled him for this whole long article. It was neat. And we both discussed, we think that the appeal of the Mickey Mouse Club partially has to do with people who grew up on it. He didn't grow up with the TV. He had no TV in his household growing up. So he oh. didn't grow up with the show. But when you look at it, you appreciate what it did. You appreciate all the art. But you really don't get it. It's just not something... You, honestly, like, you don't automatically fall in love with a net and all that just because... You didn't grow up on it. In fact, I always thought growing up when I saw it, I was like, Annette, Annette's like 20 and she's still wearing the mouse ears. It's kind of dumb. Yeah, she wasn't that old, but yeah. I don't think she quite got to 20. But no. you know what's funny though is that I did like from about age seven on, I was watching the reruns of Mickey Mouse Club. I yeah. grew up on that and they had the Little Rascals, which are the, you know, King World licensed those films and didn't have the right to the name our gang, but they called the series the Little Rascals, and right. I grew up on that stuff. So that and and the '60s Batman and um, Gilligan's Island, and even even I Love Lucy. I mean, these things were these are iconic to me. Um, and I, and I was watching Annette growing up, although in different order. Like yeah. sometimes sometimes everybody'd be older. Darlene was cuter though, honestly. Yeah. That's a whole other <laughs> um i'll say this my it, you know they, it, we're talking about when they reissued it in 1975 and uh you know it's like my mom said oh i watched this when i was a kid and i to answer camden's question uh for my mom in the 1955 it was the first thing on the air i mean you're so used to tv being round the clock all the time mm -hmm. there was nothing on tv from like I think today's show was on. So, you know, till like from nine o'clock till three, I think is when Mickey Mouse Club, it might've even been five, but it was like oh, the oh. whole day was no 
show, you know, and then, you know, Mickey Mouse Club was the first show of the day, you know, oh, so, cool. so that's what my mom saw growing up in the San Jose, San Francisco Bay Area also. I don't know if that was the same nationwide, but I mean, even as kids, TV still wasn't 24 hours. I think it finally took to like the 90s for TV to actually fully be a 24 hour day. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I remember television used to go off about two in the morning. Yeah. You know, um, and I worked at Channel 44 in San Francisco in the early 90s and they were a 24 hour day, but they still signed off at 5.59 a.m. and they signed back on at 6 a.m. Oh, was, wow. They had to do it by the FCC. That was still oh, the rules. That, and they did the Star Spangled Banner. They had the flag waving and everything. Oh, and then they had the announcement. We are ending our broadcast day. And then like a second later, welcome to Channel 40. <laughs> <laughs> Crack me up. So WGPR, the, I, I mentioned they were a Black-owned station. And the reason that I mentioned that, I think they were one of the first Black-owned stations in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and But what was cool about it is that Detroit, the, the, Detroit's still one of the more segregated cities in the country, but um, but they'd managed to put together this sort of um, do-it-yourself, low-budget version of a television station. They're more like the movie UHF than UHF even was. <laughs> but it was it was great. There was a there was a local dance show called The Scene, which was sort of um, sort of the Soul Train, like like with no budget. <laughs> and uh, and they had something called the auction movie where they would usually run a public domain movie sometimes hoppity goes to town and they would sell meat between the films and so <laughs> you would have an auction they would have an auction going back on for meat now back to gulliver's travels wow. it was amazing They're dialing for meat or but something <laughs> they also had on a, a, a guy named the ghoul who was a guy named ron swede it wasn't ghoulardi but it was just the ghoul and so the ghoul was one of my heroes as a kid because they would they had froggy the gremlin on there who he would blow up he would make he would mold him over and over again and blow up a plastic froggy the gremlin was was this in the late 60s no this was early 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 70s, 70s. okay because i think channel 44 the station i worked at they aired the ghoul there too really yeah oh that's great because uh and and there's even uh merchandise that exists um that there's a Slurpee cup that exists from that time that oh. says, watch the ghoul on channel 44. And I think a little pinback button too. I, I haven't been so ambitious to buy that because I don't remember it, even though it was the station I worked for eventually, you know, but I didn't, you know. I wish I but, could find more ghoul shows. They, yeah. <laughs> but, but he was, he was on cool. channel 50 and he was on, I think channel 20, but he kept going back and forth between Michigan and Ohio. He would be on a station in Cleveland as well. And so over those years, he kept going back and forth, but he was literally one of my heroes as a kid. Hmm. So Was that a, a Kaiser Broadcasting Station? Because Channel yeah. 44 was. Okay, so yeah. that makes sense. So now, now it makes sense. Because and then I, as a kid, I also lived in uh, L.A. for a time, and Channel 52 was a Kaiser Broadcasting Station. Henry oh. Kaiser, same Kaiser for Kaiser Aluminum, Kaiser oh, Automobile, yeah, yeah. and everything. Anyway, wow. giving Camden a history lesson so he's not too bored. <laughs> with us being Sorry, <laughs> um let's see um want to ask one more thing okay so i have one okay i'll let you ask first go ahead how did the name Th why did the name thunderbean yeah so, <laughs> so when i was a kid by, by the way jerry beck hates the name thunderbean <laughs> And he let me know that. He goes, he goes by the way, I really hate, I hate Thunderbeam. Yeah, he goes, I really know. hate your company name. He goes, he goes could, could, you know, maybe it could be something snazzier. And I was like, he goes, yeah. He goes, he goes, but I, I respect it. I, I love that, though. Because, but like, anyway, so. It makes it better. Was, <laughs> Thunder was, uh, when I was a kid, I loved puppets. And we started to do puppet shows. And so my brother and I came up with a puppet show with a sort of a superhero character. And we took the Cookie Monster puppet that we had and we made a little Thunderbean logo for his. He's a little TB like Superman and he had a cape. <laughs> and I don't know where that name came from, but we came, I think it's just mashing two words together that we thought were Did funny. Did Clamp have like a, have a puppet horse named Thunderbolt though? Yeah, yeah. But Thunderbolt I, I didn't the Wonder that. Colt, yeah. <laughs> I'd never seen that when I was a kid. I, I hadn't yeah. seen it. Oh, okay. So I thought it was a pun or something. I never really thought about Thunderbean. I thought it was like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so I never really made, thought about it. So we made these uh, puppet shows and we 
pre-taped the audio for the puppet show because then we could edit it and make it funnier. And so I still have it, but we took the Batman theme song and made a Thunderbean theme song. So I, I still have tapes of us as kids singing Thunderbean and then I'd go, oh yeah, Thunderbean, oh yeah. And one of these days, I think I'm gonna use that on the disc. I think I'm gonna have the logo come up and it'll go Thunderbean, oh yeah. Like use the old tape. And anyway, as, as kids though, we ended up naming our cat Thunderbean after a while. And so then I had a cat for 20 years named Thunderbean. Mm. That's where it came from. Um, a cat. <laughs> a lot of people think that it has a, a fart, uh, 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 you know, that it's talking about farts. Recently, uh, one of the companies, it might be Hasbro, introduced a game called Fart and Go Seek. Look this up. And they, they made one of the characters <laughs> Thunderbean. So I'm debating. Oh, on no. I'm debating. <laughs> <on something. laughs> If, if you look up Thunderbean, you'll see lots and lots of things about us, but then you'll see this Mattel or maybe it's Mattel game. Interesting. I, I worked for Mattel a lot of years ago on CD-ROM games. I also thought, because yeah, you're saying that, I thought it might be related in some weird way to Ren and Stimpy or something. I don't not, know. It, yeah. it way predates that. Yeah, and yeah. Thunderbean as a company name actually dates back to the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and Snappy Video was going to be Thunderbean at first. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I thought that it was too esoteric. Hmm. So then I called it Snappy Video instead. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it officially got incorporated first in 1997 hmm. as, a, as a name for a company. And so it was our animation company for a while. So then I have sort of a ghosted, a ghost website <laughs> of uh, the, that's the Thunderbean site. But we use thunderbeanshop.com now for our company. Anyway. That's all I got. Which can't that's, be that's, uh, because, because now, now I no longer have to ask my mom because I don't have a PayPal account still because I don't have a credit card, obviously. Mm -hmm. Which which it's always never a good idea to have a PayPal account without a credit card. Yeah, Debit cards do not work there, I've learned. Well, they'll, they'll give you a debit card. All you need is a bank account. Right. Now, well, now that the thunderbeanshop.com exists, I no longer need anyone because I no longer need a PayPal account. To buy Steve's Steve's special sets. Oh, because you can just use your bank card if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I like I like that it's been able to work like it is, but don't go broke buying my stuff, please. <laughs> hey, hey. What? That's that's not salesman technique. Come on, go broke and buy this man's <laughs> stuff. <laughs> no. I said, I, hey, hey. I have As a endorsed by Jerry about... Beck, who hates the name. No, oh, Jerry. Have a budget of about fifty dollars. Fifty dollars every pay period. Every pay period what? is like two weeks. Oh wow. So, well, now during the summer, I have a budget of like sixty dollars because I'm making a lot more money right during the summer. Same. And I'm also saving Same. a lot more for grad school, so. I want to major uh, master in archival science. So. Oh, cool! Oh, that's really yeah. fun. Yes. You, you guys are going to do cool things. Yeah. You know, I'm I work in a library right now, so. I'm I'm kind of amazed I got to do anything. Honestly, I'm <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. I, I've really enjoyed helping people animate. I enjoy drawing. I I love that I, I I love that the Rainbow Parade set came out so good. The Flip the Frog set, it looks so good. I'm just so happy. That, that exists you know whether whether i exist or not doesn't matter what matters is that the cartoons get back out there i think <laughs> will, when will the flip set come out i think at the end of july now i'm i'm waiting for dave gerstein to finish up the last few little bonus things and um i, I i'll let him you know i mean i could have just said oh that's good but he does a, such a beautiful job of it and this is a dream come true for him too to yeah. get all the flips out you know yeah. one I, I quick can I tell a quick David Gerstein story? Sure. So I was just talking to some archive right now. They're letting me lend all their stuff because they just have 9,000 Bugs Bunny newspaper strips were donated to their library. Wow. So they, I'm like, I called them up and says, can I borrow some of this for a cartoon research article? It says, sure. So it says, I'll scan whatever you want. So I asked David Gerstein, please tell me which of the best strips. <laughs> And because I knew that's he a was loaded a loaded question. That's a, if there's nine thousand of them, that's a loaded question. No, no, no but he would, I knew that if one person to know what day, what daily strips are the best, because a lot of that stuff I haven't seen. Right, the only person I know who has a lot of them is Mark Hausler in their Daily Dose web um, newspaper yeah. thing, right? Um, so I'm like, well, if there's one person that would might know is David Gerstein. So I messaged him, and I had never spoken to David Gerstein before. I don't know why. 
And he just responded, says yes. And he just, and he happened to know exactly what to do. Yeah. He's, and he he's, happened to be just, yeah. he was just giving me friendly advice of how I should go about reaching these people. What's the best way to do it? What's the best way to scan it? I'm like, well, this is better than I thought. Yeah, he's he's a great guy. Hon yeah. Honestly, there's there's a handful of people that really, without I couldn't the Thunderbean thing wouldn't happen. Dave's Dave's one of them. Mark Hauser's another. Yeah. Uh, Tommy and uh, 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 Colin Kellogg. Uh, there's a handful of people. Um, yeah, Craig Davison. A, a lot of amazing people have helped over these years. And Gerstein, I know Mark forever. Hausler, he needs to write a book, and he still won't do it. He's written lots of books. Yeah, he, yeah I know. He's credited every one of them. For it. No, he's, he a, he's a fantastic writer. I told him he needs to write a book about his own experience because Mark and I just had, I just flew up here with Mark on him on his show. Yeah, which, which is going to be posted soon. Cool. But, I, should uh, get and I, I told him on the phone one time, we need, you need to write a book about your experiences. He says, no one would read it. And I told Jerry Beck this. He says, yes, they would. He just screams on the phone and like, yes, they would. <laughs> well, Jerry Beck says that about himself. Nobody wants to read about me. And it's like, well, you know. I, I, wish, there, I wish there was a way to characterize this period. And there's other people, you know, you know as, we've, as we've come along, um, you know, Thad Komarowski has been really invaluable in helping to restore films. And, uh, and there's, so, there's so many good people right now. Yeah. You know, I, I see there being a point where Mauricio will really be uh, important. In terms of trying to get the Fleischer stuff done, yep. um, and, I, and, and other people as well, yep. um, and I think it's uh, um, it's just a mistake to discount anybody at this point. Um, uh, we we can do all this stuff without stepping on anybody's toes. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it, I just wanted to say this about Gerstein. I've known him since the early '90s because, as a group, we also all went to Comic Con in San Diego in the early '90s. Oh, That's where cool. I first met him, but. He was the same way as he is now. It's like, I, I always was like, wow, the intensity of this guy, not in a bad way. It's just that, you know, he would dig up things. That I said, like, how do you find this stuff? It, it's he's just always been that way. You know? yeah, honestly, he's another one of those film hero people. Yeah. Oh. Honestly. And I mean, um, Kosler himself, Mark as a, um, as a preservationist is, is, is invaluable. And of course that, He'll he'd probably never brag about it, which yeah. I think is also one of the most wonderful things about him. Yeah, it's but, very sweet and soft spoken. <laughs> yeah. and, he's, and he's literally helped everyone. So um, and also one of the most brilliant animators I've ever seen. Just uh, and none of none of Mark's stuff feels the same. Like he is he is a he's a true chameleon in being able to get emotion, feeling, drawing ability. I I dig it. His his two short films are are wonderful, yeah. and um, and have so much love into them. And and darn it, they're not seen very much, and they should be. So I have two more questions. If Camden has more, I'll let him ask, but I'll ask one. So, from what you can say, what <laughs> this is a loaded question. What holy grails are out there that you're still looking for? I know you probably can't say everything because I will it's all... tell you all of them. I will tell you all of them. No. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to tell you whether I've managed to find them yet. Okay. Uh, Linus the Lionheart is a holy grail to me because that should be out. Yeah. All the time for beanies that exist should be out. Yeah. Um, Mendelssohn's Spring Song was ha large on my list until it showed up. You know, the Cy Young film. Um, there's a dental commercial that Ted Ashbaugh made that someone has. I missed, I, I didn't, he won the auction and I didn't. And he's buried it. So there's a collector somewhere in the Southwest <clears throat> that has <laughs> that Kodachrome print. There's got to be another one. Um, the Toby the Pups are a holy grail to me. Like how, not just the few. There's been a few that are out, uh, but there's a lot more. You know, having all of them would be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, the Sam Small cartoons <laughs> that were produced in Britain. If they show up, I think all the Steve the Horse is being out in good quality. Um, Oh gosh, uh, we're, like we're hitting all my major ones now. <laughs> um, uh, gosh, the all the cocos, you know, having all the silent cocos, having having the Felixes that haven't been seen, <laughs> you know, huge on my list. I've I've seen a lot of them that most people haven't, and mm -hmm. and they're great. 
you know, we have a very limited idea of how that series progressed, you know, but if you see all, all of them, if you saw 150 of them, you know, you have a way better idea. You'd also get all the redundancy in them. But um, I, I think that the best Felixes are the ones that have been lost, honestly. I'm, now, now that I have seen so many of these things. Now I'm getting another question. Is, is there a possibility in lieu of doing a DVD release, doing a book based on what you observed and just do frame grabs? Yes, yes. I think that all the Felixes will be out at some point. Okay, all right. At some point it'll happen. At, at a frustrating point. story about how it's been delayed. Yeah. So that's, and, that's the most I've ever said publicly about it. Okay. Um, you know, because we'd still... Dave Gerstein and I, and, and part of this was out of respect for Dave, but um, Dave Gerstein and I tried so hard to make that work. Yeah. And, uh, and it, we, we just got to this impasse. After, after so much work, I've still, I mean, I've got my universal contract. It's just, I can't sign it and hand him 50 grand. I'd love to. <laughs> but we'd already spent the 50 grand. I said, can I just give you the cartoons, you guys? Can you do a Kickstarter or something like that? <laughs> I wouldn't get 50 grand. Oh. <laughs> I would. I would. Please. I would. I wish I was that big of an entity to be able to do these yeah. things. I think if Fair I had enough. silent films, I think I'd be able to do it. Um, <laughs> what, what else? Win like? the lottery. <laughs> or win the lottery. I've never, I've never played the lottery. I don't gamble. Yeah. That's something I've never done, honestly. It is, it isn't, it, not, not for any particular reason either. It isn't like a, I, I'm just, I just figured, I just figured that I would never win anything. So why do it? Watch you do it once and then. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just kidding. No, honestly, I don't think I've ever put a money in a slot machine. Anything. No. Heck, <laughs> life is short. Um, <laughs> what, else is a, what else is a holy grail? Jeez. <laughs> um. Oh. Oh. Uh, um. The. Uh, the missing. Uh, the missing uh, Snuffy Smith cartoons. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, um. The. Uh, the even the, even the Paramount one. You mm -hmm. know. Finding that in color would be a, a really good thing. Um, oh gosh, <clears throat> almost all the early television cartoons that have vanished, because there's a lot of them. Like like all, all the Crusader rabbits should be out. You yeah. know, like the early ones, the Fairbanks ones should be out. Yeah. Um, oh gosh. I think I've seen all of those online though too. They're online somewhere. All of them? A lot of them are. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot of them. Yeah. I, I, I'm just a completionist in this way. Yeah, so am I. What, so am what, I. What else? Oh, like like almost any independent short, I want to be able finding the Roma Gray film. That was amazing. That's David Gerstein again. You know, <laughs> that found uh, a hot tomale. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but there's more of that kind of stuff. You know, honestly, uh, the rest of Ashbaugh's things. I, I, maybe the top of the list for me is Goofy Goat in color. That's probably at the top of the list. Yeah. How about yours? What are yours, Mark? Well, I always like all the series that I've been told or wiped or destroyed or impossible to do because of music rights or something. I mean, my holy grail is probably Chuck Jones's Curiosity Shop just because I loved it as a kid. And there's little bits and pieces here and there, and you can find some of the films and some this, that, and the other. But I think a complete episode exists if i Ooh, i have two. the i have the dvds of them right now that Tim okay Hollis gave okay me. which is two more than they used to say maybe like 10 years ago they used to say oh it's just all little bits and pieces and stuff like I, that i can get you a copy of them mark these <laughs> anyway yeah. but yeah that was a show that i loved um let's see I, i'm always looking for like tv commercials in fact i i, I forgot to mention this earlier but it I don't know how much you're on Facebook, but Jerry encouraged me to start a page called TV Cartoons That Time Forgot, um, which kind of morphed around that I put just put up any sort of bizarre rare animation, even if it's by a major studio. So, like, I put the opening credits to Disney, Disney movies that are live action, but they have opening credits that are animated, you know, that people oh, forgot I about. I love because, this kind of stuff. You know, it's like the strongest man in the world and, you know... Uh, uh the north avenue irregulars things like that so i put weird stuff and then a bunch of tv commercials my holy grail right now is just because i used to see it all the time is um otter pops the you know the ice pops uh mm -hmm. they used to have a commercial that aired in the early 70s when those uh were introduced and all the otters are ice skating around on a lake and everything and they introduce the characters they used to air that thing for years and then uh, when they replaced Rip Van Lemon with Poncho Punch, they never aired the commercial <laughs> anymore. 
and people put up commercials all the time and they never seem to have that one and it's like we can't be that hard to find but maybe it is we should go through you know mark mark causler has an amazing collection of commercials we should just go through his list and see if we can find outer pops yeah so those are the weird things i'm you know, I, I'd like, to, I mean, just stuff I'd like out. And we talked about this with Kausler, right? Because he he worked on it is putting out the Duck Factory series. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. it, it seems like that would be a natural. Jim Carrey was a big star <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, you know, um, and I don't know, just, you know, I'm I'm like you. I like to get every cartoon out there. So it frustrates me because I worked on the underdog dvd set and the tennessee tuxedo dvd set and uh they had no interest to put out a king leonardo set so they put out a few random cartoons but not all of them are out and it's like you know because the output of the studio wasn't that much so that's why i'm like put the rest of it out you could have helped you know it's, it's a it's a weird thing isn't it and you you just hope that you know eventually the stuff shows up and I, I hate to think that there's a lot of this stuff just sitting somewhere and then and, and yeah. I know some of it's sitting somewhere in VSing right now and right. at some point that's not going to go through a scanner. You know? Well, to show you how things uh, get messed up, and I've said this on the podcast before, but you may not have heard this, is when I worked on those sets for Shot Factory, they had all the video of all the cartoons, but they didn't have the audio. Somewhere along the line, the audio got wiped or lost or something uh-huh. or other. So I sent them bootleg discs that of episodes that I had collected over the years, uh, lock, stock, and barrel. Just shipped everything because it was easier to do it that way. That, because there was no Dropbox or anything, you know, yeah. that you could do that. This is like 2010, you know. <laughs> so you know, and they they returned everything, but you know, they matched all the audio with the video and everything. And so that's how those cartoons exist now because I sent them the audio. <laughs> you know. It, Otherwise, it, it, you you wouldn't know that it was as precarious as it, as it is, but it is this precarious. Yeah. Like it, but finding you know we're working on the comic color stuff right now. The the uh, I works comic colors, and um, there's black and white separations on a lot of it that have, haven't been gone back to. You know, and and I works actually shot those with a prism system, so they're actually making two separate rather than making a successive exposure negative, they're two separate negatives and. Um, I love that we're going back to those, but until more recently, we really couldn't have because I, we need a scanner that would be able to handle the level of shrinkage on those films. And those films are wound on on like a spool. I remember early on in this, I was talking about them being wound really tight. They're, they're on spools and the end of it is on this little tiny spool. If, if you look at the Popeye cartoons that Paramount put out, that, or rather that Warner's put out, um, you'll see the things jittering all over the place at the beginnings. And sometimes they've even replaced the titles because they're wound on those little small spools. And right. when they scanned that stuff back then, the Scanity did, couldn't handle it as well. Now a laser graphics will keep that stuff rock solid. Yeah. So, so the advances in technology is really a, kind of an amazing thing. Flip is, um, I think that what we have out of Flip is the best that we're gonna ever get, honestly. I'm just, I'm hoping that someday somebody would be able to do a little better on titles and things because yeah. a lot of the original titles are gone and we've looked everywhere. So we do the best we could. I, I have final versions on all 38 films. I love how they look. I'm super happy with the set. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be even happier if somebody comes along with all original titles on all of them someday. Like if it yeah. supersedes what we've done, perfect. Yeah. But, but at least from this point on, there's going to be a lot better copies of all of them out there. Yeah. That's what we can hope for. And and thanks to you, Tennessee like, Tuxedo looks nice. You know? <laughs> well, the other thing I'd like is, you know, Warner Archives was great in putting out all these obscure, read bad, uh, Hanna-Barbera, <laughs> Hanna-Barbera series uh, during the last decade or so. You don't have to wish but they're bad. Still, we all think they're bad. Yeah, but they're still missing ones. Like, those were the days and uh, the Catanooga Cats and things like that. And there might be music rights Quick tied up with McGraw. that one. But, I mean, not everything is out. Quick Draw McGraw is a music rights thing. Uh, but, oh, uh, no. you know, it it's like... Is just the wolf out or... What? Is it what it's called? The one with the wolf in it? Yeah, is it's it... the wolf. That's Yeah, that was on Catanooga Cats. You know, Did that was one of the segments. Out? They have not Did... put that out. I didn't think so. Yeah, so I remember that stuff really well. 
Yeah. But, it, but and, I grew up those Pixie and Dixies and the Huckleberry Hounds. The, the Huckleberry Hounds were great when I was a kid. Like right. they were almost like a theatrical cartoon to me. Yeah, it's yeah. weird because as a kid, you know, they, they aired them constantly and then, you know, yeah. now nothing, you know. Yep. And so yeah. those are like my holy grails is that type of stuff. Just all the Saturday morning stuff that I grew up with from the 60s and 70s. You know, it's like, even if it's the worst crap, I still want it all out. Have they yeah. have they ever put out the Hound Cats? No. Oh, no, no, they did. They finally did. They finally oh, did. Yeah, so I, when I did my DePatty Freeling book, uh, so it's a little dated now. They had only put out this company called Synergy, which I don't know how uh, reputable game. they were, but they put out four episodes. But uh, during uh, the time right after my book came out, maybe it's because of my book. I don't know. They, they put out the complete Hound Cats and the complete Barclays. Oh, wow. But, but a series, which isn't very good, that they could have also put out is the complete Bailey's Comets, which is still MIA, so... What, yeah. what about Heathcliff and Fangface? Uh, Heathcliff is Dick, Deek, or whatever you have pronounced it. <laughs> um, I think they did put out a, D, uh, a DVD set of that. Fangface is one of those weird ones. It's Ruby Spears, and then now Hannah Barbera owns it. Yeah. And it's just kind of MIA, too. So, you know. Yeah, Scott the- Shaw, I interviewed, I did a Hannah, my, my final essay in my historian's craft essay it was The Rise and Fall of Hannah Barbera. And it's this 20 page paper and I worked really hard on it. And Jerry Eisenberg helped me with it. Jerry, Jerry Beck helped me with it. Leonard Moulton helped me with it. All these different people. Scott Shaw told me the weirdest stories about things. So there's, there's, you know that there's no such person named Scott Shaw, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's no Scott Shaw. What are you talking about? You, you have the name wrong. Like yeah, his, name is, for his name is, and you have to say it this way, his name yeah. is Scott Shaw. <laughs> Scott Shaw. <laughs> Scott's so wonderful, isn't he? Yeah. He's such a great guy. <laughs> That's why I was doing the phonetic punctuation for him. Scott Shaw. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually stealing that joke from Milton Knight. <laughs> who always, whenever we talk, he'd say, "Oh yeah, I just talked to Scott Shaw." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've really never cool. done that. I've, I've I've never done that with Scott. I don't think I'll start. But <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe you don't need to. But uh, what, what, Camden? It's so cool that you're doing all the things that you are. You yeah. Know, uh, the the there's a handful of you guys, mm-hmm. but it's like a handful, and you probably know all the players. Yeah. You're, you're in, You'll continue to know them, and it's. I know. I know the. Be- I know the best of the players. The other players. Yeah, are, there's some well, not are, so are, good. Are, we won't mention those, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a. It's a. It's a weird world, and to me, the most important thing because people we we all love this stuff. The, yeah. the most important thing to me is to figure out how to get along with everybody. To, yeah, to, that's, well, that's what I try to do. And to be to be to be a good citizen, and the, the internet. <laughs> has set up, I think, a situation where it's easy to not be a good citizen. It's also easy <laughs> to talk smack about somebody on the internet. And um, you, you meet those people in person, you know, and you, you realize, you know, whatever, whatever uh, arguments have existed, we're just all human beings. Yeah. And uh, we, we've gotten to a point now where it becomes really easy to say things are really not very nice to somebody and to start flame wars and... Mm-hmm all sorts of things just unnecessarily so mm-hmm. most people most people though i've gotten along just fine with yeah oh, me, me too and uh, i i tend to get to a point like where i'm just like running around and too busy for everything and forget yeah. about the actual enjoyment of this so um fortunately sometimes mary has to bring me back down to earth to enjoy <laughs> the other things in life besides working all the time so um these days I'm having the best summer, by the way, because so much of stuff is getting done. Mm-hmm. So many things are getting done. And I'm like some of this new stuff coming back as scans, I just smile. Mm-hmm. You know, it just looks great. So anyway. So I'm pretty much done with questions. Camden, do you too. have any more? I'm good okay. too. I gotta get up. I gotta get up early. All right. <laughs> So I appreciate both of you, especially Steve, for finally being on the show. I know there's a little hiccup getting it on. The- Sorry about that. Before, but hey, you know, yeah. I keep trying until finally I just say, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, well, it's cool. You've done it. Can we can we end it with Popeye with a tail? 
sure. Hold on. Let's see if I can find him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I got to put these back up, but the little Jack in the Box figures are here, too. Do you remember when Jack in the Box had these guys? Oh, yeah. I got those. Rubber I guys? have those. <laughs> and the little... I have that. <laughs> and then this little dude here. I have that. <laughs> that was the bad guy. Yeah. You know, so, so there's the hamburger there's guy and oh Donald <laughs> like with a tail for some reason. Wow, that's weird. But He's, I have one the characters like that, those little snap together type characters. Yeah, and then this Popeye is the weird one. <laughs> but he's got a tail. I don't know why he's got Jeez. a tail. But I love this. Like thing. a duck. I've I've had this since I was a kid. You know what the best thing? So this is the side where Popeye's looking sort of like vacant but this one popeye's really side-eyeing you <laughs> he's just like looking sort of sneaky. wow i like him yeah, too big of an eye for popeye <laughs> yeah he's got an eye on both sides so you know he was faking yeah <laughs> so steve so to end the show we usually have the guests uh promote uh if you're making any personal appearances what your latest products are coming out and what we should expect in the future and how they can get in contact with you. So, Oh gosh, you're giving, I, I hate doing plugs. I'm not good at it. Oh, this is the best part. Most people right, live so for I this just, part. You just finished this thing. All right. Just in my in the mailbox. Ready. Okay. I'm just okay. like reaching over here, here. Okay. It's a, it's well, a what, Camden, let Camden, Camden help. Wow. <laughs> what Camden, else? what's the latest ones he's put out? Well, oh, I know that one. Well, um, yeah, but um, you have mine's supposed to arrive on Friday. Well, no, the the That's ones good. he did previously. What are the most recent ones he put out? If if he doesn't, know? I guess this one. Okay, um, which yeah. is oh the Betty Boop one. Okay, all right. I got, yeah. I got news. We're actually updating this. Oh, okay. Oh, sweet. Yes. Yay. <laughs> um. All right. Rainbow Parade Two. God, I'm trying to think of what else is. The big things that are coming out right now are the the Van Buren Tom and Jerry sets almost done. Um the uh we, we've got another the party disc two set if you didn't buy party disc two in pre-order though you're not getting it because we're not gonna we're not gonna distribute it beyond this but it does have the adventures of super screw on it if that's what you really want <laughs> and uh, it's it, yeah it, it was a fun set to do what what else just got done um lots of special sets it's weird so to do a promo. The stop motion Marvel set is almost done. And so, do you make any personal appearances other than podcasts and stuff? I mean, do you go to conventions or oh, anything? Like that? Some sometimes. Yeah. Okay, but I it's not a regular thing. Okay. While. I'm out in Michigan, so okay. I'm on an island out here. <laughs> um, we we do a show at the Redford Theater every year. We show 35 millimeter, you know, prints. Um, yeah. What else? Yeah. Gosh. Hey, Steve, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, my I'm. I know I've told you before about my pal, and I'm sure you know him too, Skip Craig. I don't know. Um, Skip I Craig is the that. Skip Craig is the sound that. editor for Rocky and Bullwinkle, and he's still oh, around. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I talk to him all the time on the phone. For your mid new mid century modern set, if you had a UPA cartoon from that era, I'm sure he would gladly talk to you about it. There is there is cool stuff on that set, honestly. I've, I've scanned a lot of stuff for that set. Because he's, because he's 90, he just turned 91, and he's still yeah. got all these great stories, and it's perfect. Oh, geez, now i got to hurry. <laughs> <laughs> the mid, the, that mid centuries modern set is really cool, I, honestly. The the third one I really like. But it, it, it's got some stuff from the 60s on it. I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get a film that exists in 70 millimeter on it. I don't know how lucky I'm going to be, but if I'm lucky, I'll be able to get it. And what's the website again? There, that's an easy book. Oh, thunderbeanshop.com. Okay. That's sort of um, where we are. But I'm on the um, Blu-ray forum a lot. Okay. Like Blu-ray.com, there's a thread that's Thunderbean. And I'm chatting all the time about this stuff. All right. Cool. So, so if you want to keep oh. up to date, I, I mean, I write, I write every week for Jerry Beck. So um, cartoonresearch.com. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a channel that was just streaming cartoons all the time? <laughs> i'm just saying someday <laughs> cool. all right well i want to thank you steve sanchfield and thank you Candace v for being my special guests yep thank and you so much guys I have a lot of guests. i've appeared more than almost anyone i know he's on all the time i was trying to get him off of here <laughs> what's, your, what's your camden what's your drawing in the back there what what animation drawing is that that behind me is um, is a model Holly Pratt's model sheet for Tweety's SOS. Oh, cool! 
it's, and it's, then it's up below market. that is a what's opera doc layout okay that's oh, what we see we don't see the other one the first one you said it's not it's not on camera so it's the what's opera doc that's on camera yeah oh, on, the, on the next to me is the one i showed you a while back steve behind me right in this way is um well below it is two quick draw mcgraw sales from the opening titles um and then another, above it is the popeye yeah. meets william tell um poster um i think i sent you an email of this oh cool yeah yeah that's awesome yeah cool. but you even told me like that you knew the guy who owned it which oh it was leslie cabargas yeah, yeah. There, there's so so there's there's a Les Brooks had a bunch of stuff too that he got from Florida. Les, Les Brooks ran a company called Mice, Ducks, and Wabbits for a while. Yeah, he, I knew that that was not a. But when the Chuck Jones Gallery, my friend Carol, my friend Carol, I think that she sends me like a note, like half of the books on my shelf just come from her because she just constantly, like, just because she's a friend, she just sends me stuff all the time. <laughs> like that. Yeah, and but she like, um, yeah, she um. She showed me this that was on sale, and I'm like, "Well, I know Popeye and Tolkien comes out the best Popeye American, but when am I ever going to see a Popeye piece again?" So I'm like, I'm "Like, well, Mom, Dad, I have my graduation present now. <laughs> I got it. That's good. Awesome. Cool. All I, right. I collect some animation art, and have have a little box of kind of a big box of stuff. And at some point, things are going to get hung here. Yeah. Someday." The framing is the most expensive part I learned. Mm -hmm. Yep. For sure. <laughs> well, Mark, it's been super fun. Thank you so much for putting up with me and, uh, and putting up with me. Right yeah, and we'll have you back at some point, probably when you put out one of those other big sets or something. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, thank you very much. And that wraps it up for another Fun Ideas podcast. And we'll see you next time. Okay, thanks so much.